tweeting, doing the Twitter thing. Can you hear me? Comments Stonehenge. Section. That was a Doctor Who reference. So we've, we've won. I win. I, I beat Hang you. On. I made the first Doctor Who reference in the stream. TARDIS. Do, do, Doctor Who TARDIS. That's, oh, a, no, there that's in Doctor okay. Who. That's a thing that is in Doctor Who. Hello, chats. Give me some boobs, chat. Go on. <laughs> and other things that could be taken out of context. <laughs> chat, send us boobs. Come on, say things. Is it, is it frozen? No one's typing things. There we go. There we go. We're getting some responses. Can you hear this? Do I sound like I'm in a cupboard again? Well, you don't yeah, sound like you're in a cupboard on my end, and my, yeah, I'm give, directly streaming give your Stu money, that Give Stu money, that's a meme that I've done, or something. Where's Reginald from Nigeria? Is he here? Yeah, come on, Reginald from Nigeria. Okay, we're getting all the memes. Do do the meme thing. Um. Anyway, uh, hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. We're, we're here to do better than chips. Yeah, we're here to do better than shiz. Because if you, if you, if, uh, if you were watching last time, you will know that recently. You will know that recently, um, Chris Chibnall is not the showrunner of Doctor Who anymore. It's now us. It's us. Oh, could you imagine? Yeah, I can imagine. Imagination is a powerful thing. Currently imagining. Currently imagining that I have a salary and house. And I get paid to write Doctor Who. That's nice. I like that. That would be that would be so just like idyllic. Is that how you say that word or is it idyllic? Idyllic, idyllic. Who cares? It's fucking linguists. They care. It doesn't matter which your you use. It does actually. <laughs> yeah, well, it's gonna it's gonna stop it's gonna stop mattering eventually because no one no one uses them correctly anyway. No, but that's we're one of get, those things where um, we're gonna get to a, we're gonna get to a point where it doesn't matter what your you use. No, no, eventually, because that's useful for communication. Yeah, but the English language is shit anyway. It's just... Let's not make it worse. Yes, but yes, but the internet. The internet. Eventually, everyone's just going to communicate by like projecting memes out of their eye sockets. <laughs> oh, that would be a good story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, that that's well, that's a, that's a good thing. That shows I'm in a creative mood. H hang on, I'm gonna I'm gonna write that on my notes. Uh, I just I have a I have a notepad app on my um, phone where I just write. Right ideas that I come out with. Okay, projecting memes out of your eye sockets. There we go. Um, I don't know why we wrote... Okay, so I'm looking at the notes we got for, for last season. Because what we're doing is we're doing a direct follow-on. You know, this is season two of our reboot of the show. Right? So, obviously a direct follow-on from the previous season. But... Which, which, if you'll remember correctly, was the most depressing thing that has ever been written by humans. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do want our second season to be um, effective enough on its own that someone who hasn't watched the first one would be able to pick this up and watch it as its own story. Yeah, like, they'd be able to detect the sadness in the Doctor after the end of... Yeah, I mean... Oh, after the end of the last season, where it's, where it's like it ends with him looking over this, looking over this beautiful field, just thinking, why... There, might, there should have been a better way. <laughs> because we'll we'll start the season by establishing that he's a character in grief because he's just lost someone and he blames himself, right? That's something we need to re-establish because it's important to establish that to our audience. They we they will assume it anyway, but if we're not a sta if if new viewers can't also pick up on it, I feel we're not doing our job. Yes, that is true. Um, okay, so let's just just go well, over. Well, well, hmm? While while we're while we're on that, while we're going back over um what we did last time, um, yeah, are we going to are we saying that uh, the fake Christmas special that we came up with at last minute because we couldn't be asked the five Ranis? That's a joke, right? We're going to do a proper Christmas special. Yes, um, I have. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because I, I think the I think the five Ranis is um I I am very tempted to keep the Rani in it. And we could also have as a one off companion you know the Sarah Jane Adventures character Rani. I didn't watch the Sarah, Sarah Jane I I watched some of the Sarah Jane Adventures, not much of it though. So there was um an aspiring journalist uh high school girl called Rani, uh, and she was a fun character, and I see no reason she couldn't pop in as like a one episode companion for our new Doctor. Um, and then we could call it the two Rani's. <laughs> yeah. So this would be in an episode where the actual Rani is in it. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's what um, here's maybe the... it's maybe it's like we could, maybe it's like um. Maybe it's like there's some confusion over which character is actually the Rani. I mean, they now, would know. Because now that now now that no, no, but that's the thing. Because now the now um, every character is the Rani until proven otherwise has <laughs> become a meme. Yeah, we, you you kind of if you're gonna do an episode where you bring back the Rani, you kind of need to have reference to that. Yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm on board with that. Okay, so I wanted okay I, before we get into writing our new stuff, I feel like for people here. They might not have an, a, a perfect memory of what happened last season. Which we, we don't either. Yeah, yeah. So we've got our notes here for that. You could go and watch the four-hour stream quickly and then come back to this one. Um, quickly. And if, if you're an archive viewer Emphasis, watching this... Emphasis, on, emphasis yeah. on quickly. If you're... You know, there's a two-point... There's a, a, two, a times two speed button on YouTube. But if you're an archive viewer watching this on the uh, on the re-upload, which a lot of well, you that, probably are, well, well, that and that and time moves a different speed in in lockdown because you know the that is true. the pubs are the the pubs are open, but people aren't really doing much at the moment. So, mm. if you're watching this on archive, watch the other one first. Um, I'll link it on screen now, and I'll definitely remember to do that. So you that you is can a law. Be sure yeah, that, that you, you, you have, click the link. You have to you have to watch the first one first. You have to be pedantic and you you know canon continuity. It's important. So the first words in our notes were cake drugs. Do you remember why? <laughs> <laughs> I have no fucking clue. <laughs> oh, um, I was talking about Chris Morris. That was it. I, oh, I was right. talking. I was talking about. I was talking about brass iron. I was talking about how I wanted to have a doctor who was like, who's who was like sort of a bad guy. But our and doctor was that, eventually Alan Rickman. I, yeah, our doctor was eventually Alan Rickman. Who I like the idea of cast, casting someone who's typically a typically a villainish villainish sort of character in a good in a in a um good guy role. And speaking of bad guys, didn't we have that idea to cast Billie Eilish as a companion? Yes, that was who our companion was. Uh, was um, she's on the. Oh no! Then it moved on to um, Haley St Haley Steinfeld. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Fuck, I yeah, got, Haley I got Steinfeld them confused. Because um, um, she is a pop star who used to principally be an actress, and she won an Oscar, so that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, and our companion's name was Jodie Queen because we like the idea of, because we like the idea of um, having a companion who turns who turns out to um, have a dark future called Jodie. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we if we were actually going to do it, we'd probably call her somewhat something else. But uh, for the sakes of the stream, it was just funny the idea well, of um, of us calling the companion Jodie. And like people who are fans of the previous era going, oh, that's nice. You know, they're, they're paying respects to, to the 13th Doctor by calling companion Jodie. And then she kills millions. Uh, but uh, OK, so we introduced her in an episode called Lockdown, which um, I've, I've, I'm, it's remarkable. I, it's important that I actually do remember enough details because the notes I wrote here were big, fleshy aura. Um, so these were creatures that, uh, had been, uh, growing in dis- like, these are immobile, like, fungusy creatures that were that, growing- um, that take up, that take up residence in em buildings in public spaces that have been emptied because of lockdown. Yeah, so these, these things were growing there. 
And they're um, like sending out spores across the local area, like hypnotizing people and drawing them to it. Yeah, they, they feed it's by like... uh, taking over people's minds from a distance and just getting them to walk over and jump in, essentially, and be absorbed by the... Oh, it's the absorber. <laughs> um, actually, while, while we're on this, um, uh, after, after we did that stream, I ended up writing this as a little short story. This, the first episode? Yeah, well, it's not Doctor. It's not Doctor Who related. Obviously, I took the Doctor out of it. I wrote a little short story about um, a woman who is in lockdown and she's shielding. She's taking care of her elderly mother who's suffering from dementia, and her mother keeps on trying to leave the house because she's been affected by these spores. And she's going, "I must go to him. I must go to him." That is pretty. That's pretty dope. That's very Doctor Who as well. Yeah, it's very dark. And yeah, and it ends with her managing to get out of the house and the woman's like horrified because everyone in the local area is going to this is going to this gym where this like where this like plant like alien monster thing has been drawing people to it because, you know, the gym is empty. Uh, and no one goes to it. Then we had our episode two, The Meddling Monk Returns in Tomorrow's World. Um it's I, I, I was my, really, I really like this story, which is which is my baby of an idea. Yes, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a trite idea, but I love I it. I don't because... think so. I really like it. Yeah, I, it made me laugh when I came up with, when I came up with it. So we have we had the meddling monk who was who was the first Time Lord villain in Doctor Who uh, show up, uh, played by Graham Garden uh, in the eighties. He, he he shows up in the eighties where there is a television show called Tomorrow's World that predicts the future, and all of the predictions are accurate. And that's because he's bringing back things from the future and showing them. Um, and the Doctor has to deal with that. Happy Time was our big pink fluffy bunny episode, where the villains were big pink fluffy bunnies. <laughs> just, for the, ju just for the lols, because that's what Doctor Who does. It comes up with, like... It's 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 has like cute aliens which turn out to be psychopathic. Yeah, if you want to if you want to understand our full rationale, which there wasn't much of, to be fair, watch the previous stream. Uh, episodes four and five were our first two parter. This was like this was my baby at the time. Um, we did a, a historical story about the Sontarans, so a, essentially fictional pure historical, uh, an alien pure historical. Um, and this is where we started characterizing our companion as a uh, very uh, sort of a very strong sense of justice um, and essentially wanting to fix the problems that she saw in, in this world by any means necessary. Uh, yeah, I mean, we don't need to fully explain all of these episodes. Um, yeah, it's in the previous stream. Yeah. yeah, we need to give enough context so that people will... Uh, understand what we're referencing in this stream well yeah that and it will be, that and it will build us into the yeah, next yeah. one the next season um then is my baby um the untold case of dr jackal and mr hyde because i really would like more historical hit historical based doctor who episodes which it which kind of kind of are quite light on the what light on the sci-fi so this is about um uh this is about robert louis stevenson writing dr jackal and mr hyde and he starts hearing a voice in his head as he's writing it that's telling him to go out and stop, commit acts of extreme violence. And it's like the Doctor and the Companion take on the guise of his therapist who's talking him through it as he's writing the story. Um, uh, he, yeah, th there I finished the sentence. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy you did. Not that it was a bad sentence and I'm glad it's over, just that I'm, I'm happy for you that you achieved such things. Hooray! I can speak. Um, episode seven was where the show was where our season went mask off and stopped pretending to be a normal season of the show. Um, not that it was normal for our, our episodes were sort of um, more. They, there was less in our episodes to keep the kids strung along. Essentially, our episodes were more. If you're not interested in like the concepts we're working with, you might be bored. As the, the you know, we're going for well, a lot conceptual of stuff well, and dark stuff. Yeah, con conceptual stuff and dark stuff because a lot of it's quite horrible. Like the Doctor Jack and Mister Hyde one is like heavy mental mental health related shit. Yeah. And this next one is about um, the Cybermen and propaganda. Yeah. So now in Silver Salvation, 
uh, the Cybermen use uh, propaganda to uh, recruit rather than force, which is something we've never seen them do before. They always recruit people by force. They always uh, kidnap people and convert them into Cybermen. Uh, in this, they are taking advantage of a disenfranchised society or disenfranchised, disenfranchised people in a failing society and persuading them to become Cybermen uh, by going, oh, you know, all those horrible feelings you have, we'll take those away and you can be part of a cool unit uh, and we, you know, we work, we work together, and all of that. They they recruit with propaganda. It's it's dope. But, yeah, basically they they basically they're using social media to recruit people. Yeah. And there's like an there's like an info wars type type guy who's um on the on the internet go. Well, I think that the Cybermen might actually have a point. You know. Exactly, and that you, you say that you you know you say that like a, a a parody, but you know it's essentially it is doing anti vaxxers with the Cybermen. But, yeah, essentially. But we want to be subtle enough that it's that people don't go, oh, very clever. The anti-vaxxers are the Cybermen. Whoa, you know, we won't, we won't, we won't be super heavy-handed with how we do it. Um, we've, uh, but th this episode goes mask off because at the end of the episode we get the twist for the season, uh, which is that someone in the future where this is taking place recognizes the companion as a historical figure. Um, Someone in the chat just put their turn in the freaking frogs mechanical. <laughs> oh god. Um, yeah, if I was gonna if I was gonna jump the shark here, it would be like um, the Cybermen make Cybermats out of frogs. <laughs> oh, that'd be beautiful. Someone wears a tin foil hat, but it's because they want to look more like a Cyberman. <laughs> But yeah, this is where uh, this is where our companion finds out that um, that she is destined to essentially to become a historical figure in the future. She is known as a historical figure who does horrible things. So starts to doubt the intentions of the Doctor for bringing her with him. Uh, which takes us into episodes eight and nine. These were like our least fleshed out episodes, I think. Um, yeah, ba ba basically where we um, basically where we try and make ancient aliens into a two-part doctor who serial yeah we have a like a, a cool premise for the this and that's pretty much it so the the premise for these episodes was that um the the doctor and jody land in prehistoric uh earth uh where early man is dawning and aliens are visiting the planet regularly to take away some of the local human population and sell them on a, uh, an alien slave market. Which explains why throughout Doctor Who's history, there have been aliens from other planets that look exactly like humans. And we would leave it ambiguous as to whether or not that's where the Time Lords came from, so that basically anyone can head headcanon it with their preferred answer. My preferred answer is that the Time Lords came from uh, an offshoot of humans that were kidnapped as slaves, um in prehistory and then you know free became free and built a society of their own but i know that's going to be um that would be a controversial addition to the canon so it would just be you know jody asked the doctor oh so is that where in your the, people came in, from in the doctor is wouldn't you like to know in this episode what if, what if a twist in this episode is it wasn't earth all along <laughs> You know, because like that's the twist in Orphan Fifty Five and Mysterious Planet, where it's, it, it was Earth all along. What if this? It's it look. It seems like it's Earth, but it actually wasn't. It was just another planet. I'd prefer it how it was, but we could do that twist along the I line. It's a fun twist. I don't know. It's an idea. It is a fun Oost twist. I just don't think Oost it works in the story. Yeah, Oost, yeah. Just I think that's just me trying to be trying to be too subversive. But the um, the the point of this story as well is that. Uh, now that Jody has discovered that she is uh, a historical figure of some description, that she uh, goes on to be a, an awful leader responsible for the deaths of like countless people in wars, um, she is very mistrustful of the Doctor. She's having an existential crisis about her future, and that's what drives all of her actions throughout this story. Uh, it's, it's essentially, you know, the story has its own premise and plot, but at the same time, there's something going on with these characters and that drives our main character's actions much more than the plot at hand. Like Rick Mancing the Stone, that episode of Rick and Morty set in the Mad Max uh, parody world. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a parody of Mad Max, but actually it's all about the kids dealing with Beth and Jerry's divorce. 
you watch that episode again? That one was that one was probably one of the better ones from season three. It's really good. It's a really yeah, good episode. I love that one. I sang its praises in the video that no one's ever going to see because I lost it. Then we had 2060, which was an episode oh. set in uh, 20, uh, 2012. No, set in 2060. 2060, yeah. And this was our um, bottle episode where it's set literally inside in a pub in this fascist utopia in fascist Dystop utopia <laughs> fascist utopia that was, Stuart, that was, is there something that, you want to tell us that was that was a bit of a freudian slip wasn't it yeah fascist yeah set a bottle episode set in a pub in a fascist dystopia uh Dysto dystopia important dystopia. detail this is the dystopia being uh led by our companion you know th this is the era that she leads and does horrible things um, and now, obviously, that she's there visiting as a young person when she, as an old person, is ruling over it. Uh, and this is the episode where the Doctor discovers that she knows that it's her in charge because the Doctor is desperately trying to shield her from that information because he's taken her there by mistake. Uh, and, and she just tells him, yeah, I know already. Um, and then they have a row. Let's, let's call it a row. Episode 11 was The Prisoners, where we had... Um, we had uh, this was our mandatory Dalek story because we we're going along with the rule that they're contractu contractually obligated to be in every season, uh, if it's even if it's a cameo or a full story. Uh, but if because, this is in fact a rule, yeah. But which we've we written don't the know story just... now anyway, so fuck it. Yeah. Um, but because we don't want to blow our load on a full blown Dalek story in the first season, uh, we want to keep people waiting for that. We did uh, a story where there are a few Daleks being held prisoner by a Van Staten type figure, but they don't get out at all. Uh, and it's an exploration of, uh, of what happens to Daleks when they essentially lose their Dalekness because they are uh, kept and tortured forever and essentially go through a Daleks version of trauma and become something else, which they being Daleks that hate any anything else would hate. And this is where we sort of set up that um, our companion who goes on to com commit mass genocide has some sort of sympathy for the Daleks. Yes, but not because they commit genocide. Not because they commit genocide, but because they're in a sympathetic situation. Yeah, because they're in a sympathetic situation where anyone really who doesn't know what they've done would feel sympathetic for them because they're being held prisoner and tortured and are helpless. It's not. I saw a couple of comments on the last one we did where people were going, you know, um, she, she doesn't have to sympathize with literally the worst. Uh, I don't know why I'm doing a silly voice for this. It was a reasonable criticism, um, but it's not actually what we said, I guess. She doesn't have to. The idea that she doesn't have to sympathize with the Daleks to be a terrible person herself and that that's a bit too heavy handed. I agree that that would be too heavy handed, which is why she's not sympathizing with like Dalek causes of destroying all life. Oh, someone in the chat just said that Stephen Moffat said that apparently there is no contra contractual obligation. Oh, cool. We don't have to have one this year. Yeah, well, actually, actually, th speaking of that, I've come up with an idea for a Dalek story, which I think would be quite cool, so maybe we would have to. I want to build up to our first big Dalek story. Is it a small Dalek story or is it it's a big quite, Dalek it's story? A, it's a small Dalek story. Good, I'll allow it. <laughs> I, I as our, as your equal part, partner in this enterprise, will allow you to do something. <laughs> For some reason, I've just been reminded of. Um, do you remember that Simpsons episode where um, Homer sort of accidentally blags his way into uh, blags his way into being a pilot of a plane, and um, he go, go he's um there with his co-pilot, and he goes, <laughs> he's there with his co-pilot, and the co and uh, he says, "Hi, I'll be your co-pilot today." He goes, "Um, I think I'm going to let you do, you do most of the piloting today. I think you're ready for it, Alan." Yeah, and then he presses the buttons that to, to take the wheels out. <laughs> oh yeah, that was fun. Uh, we should watch more good symptom, symptoms. Symptoms. It's correct. The pandemic. Symptoms. <laughs> yeah, symptoms. Um, and then we've got uh, episode eleven. You no, know, that was the one we just read out. Mm, yes, I'm very clever. Uh, episode 12 and 13 were a double, our two-part finale in which uh, the Cybermen return in their more usual form as uh, as a vengeful force. This is set after the previous episode where they've established more power. They are a military force now. 
uh, and they have a plot to get the doctor out of the way before they uh, before they start uh, before before they try to well as they try to conquer more and more planets to make more and more Cybermen because surviving and expanding is their prerogative. Um, so their plan to get the Doctor out of the way is to just uh, try and get him to uh, surrender himself to them so he can be killed. Uh, and they do that by having loads of hostages which they kill every so often until he surrenders himself. Um, the story shows them managing to not totally defeat the Cyberman Empire because they're just two people and that would be silly unless they found like a really, really neat way to do it. But um, it shows them managing to free the hostages instead of uh, surrendering themselves. But because Jodie knows that she becomes this, uh, or is, there's a high chance she'll become this horrible person who does horrible things, she's been becoming... Um, very uh okay with the idea that she dies before then and thereby saving all of the people that she would kill in the future uh she doesn't kill herself but she essentially goes on a on more and more dangerous like you know she does more and more dangerous she becomes, things she becomes reckless yeah, yeah. acting more exactly. and more carelessly with her own life until it results in her death uh which it traumatizes the doctor. Uh, we also said that um, she dies in an explosion, and the doctor is near enough to the explosion to be injured and has permanent scars now. Until the next regeneration. As a constant reminder. Yeah, exactly. That he couldn't save her. That's the thing. And it's going to be a really cool moment when her doctor does regenerate and the scars go away. Life is pain. I already know what I want to do for a Doctor's Regeneration. I, I don't know if you have any other ideas. If you do, I'll listen to them. I haven't no, I haven't thought about it yet. You go for it. But uh, we, we're not going to regenerate no, our Doctor yet. This is the second season. Yeah. We're, I think we'll assume that he'd go for like... I mean, I guess we can... We can, we I mean, can decide how it fits the story. But the average, is, yeah. the average is three and a bit. Because... Um, I've never actually worked out the mean. Well, in in well in New Who, it's uh, three and a bit if you exclude Chris because Chris doesn't really count because he only did the one and then left immediately. It's it wasn't yeah. exactly typical. Yeah. But um, David Tennant did three seasons and then a run of a load of specials, which didn't really count as a season, but were more episodes. Matt Smith did three seasons and then a run of specials that don't really count because there were uh, were more episodes. Peter Capaldi did three seasons and then an extra year in which there weren't any episodes but there were like a couple of specials so it's a bit like an extra season but not really uh, maybe that's what Jodie will do as well it'd be nice if she left sooner <laughs> no it'd be nice if Chris left sooner I don't really care if Jodie stays or not actually it would be nice to see her stay long enough to get some competent writing so that we have a so that we don't have an entirely shit incarnation of the Doctor mm, I I don't. I don't know. That hasn't happened before, has it? No, no way it had. No way it has. Back in back in the back in the classic series, Tom, Tom, his last year was John Nathan Turner, and but then John. But his entire um... his entire run was handed between. Oh, who who was it? Who was several. It Hinchcliffe. Yeah, several, several people. Hinchcliffe, um, Graham Williams. But uh, the, the the only Doctor, I think, whose entire run is shit on TV is Colin, but he got the big finish that redeemed him. There's the odd decent co co decent Colin yeah, one. Okay. I mean, there, isn't, there, isn't really, there isn't really one that I would call like, a solid gold classic, like you're not a proper Doctor Who fan if you don't like this one. Blah, blah, blah. You're not a proper Doctor Who fan if you don't like Terror of the Vervoids. Terror of the Vervoids? <laughs> Terror of the Vervoids is funny. Um, I was pointed out to me reason, by for one reason and one reason only. I, uh, my favorite thing about Terror of the Vervoids is this is something that was pointed out by Clever Dick Films, is that in it Mel lets out a scream in one of the cliffhangers that exactly matches the tone of the uh, of the sting before the end credits music. So her <laughs> scream goes perfectly into the actual. 
and it's great. Watch Cleverdick Films' uh, video on the sixth. I th actually, I think it's in his video for the seventh Doctor, because and that's where he's talking about Mel. Um, but yeah, watch that video just for that moment, if anything. Um, but our companion is dead. Our Doctor is bereaved, and that takes us to our Christmas special, which we haven't done yet. <laughs> like. I think we've kind of fucked ourselves here by having a Christmas special, which is going to be very dour and somber. Well, I think it would... We can play our Doctor as essentially um, the man who has to be cheered up by the other characters in the Christmas special. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> a, a Christmas stories about a sad, grumpy man are a huge staple. And this is, that, very, this is definitely going to be a sad, grumpy man. Who's that, sort that of is, having an existential is, crisis because he, he blames himself for this, of course. That is true. I mean, that's basically a Christmas carol, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I mean, his... Uh, let's, Christmas, let's a, do... Christmas carol in the, a Christmas carol as in a Christmas carol, not the Doctor Who episode, Christmas carol. Let's do a Doctor Who episode, a Christmas carol too. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas uh, carol two, electric boogaloo. No, okay, so... Shit. Oh, well, I had something, I had something here. Yeah, our, wait, um, our doctor is definitely going to blame himself because his intention with taking her on board was to wait, help her have positive experiences earlier in life and set her yeah. down a different path. And she dies because of her experiences that he gave her. I'm just thinking, um, you, you said that you wanted to try and bring Adric back in a totally straight-faced, proper way, right? Yes, I, I, uh, this is going to be a one-episode thing. It's a premise for an episode, which... Uh... Right, because right, my, right, my thinking is, because Adric is the only other Doctor Who companion that the Doctor had to let die. You've, you've got the thematic link. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. it. I mean, well, t technically, because it's like, uh, as in on screen. Yeah. This is the... Um... So maybe that's maybe that's how we do it. Maybe this Christmas special, it's we revisit Adric's death death in some way in this Christmas special, and that's the well, that's I, the Doctor coming to terms with his grief. I do want to make the episode that I've got in plan to come back uh, a mid season episode, because this is what I want to do with bringing back Adric. This isn't a letting him process his grief. This is twisting the knife, but also letting him process his grief at the end of the episode. We'll twist okay, twist the it. knife for the whole episode, but but this is I think I think this wants to be a mid season thing. Oh, Katerina, Katerina and Sarah, yeah, as well. But Adric's the one that's made the most impact, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. But uh, thank this... you, thank you, people in the comment section telling me about Katerina and Sarah. I Sarah do King. have a really fun idea for a Christmas special, but it isn't really the time for a fun Christmas special. Well, it could always be the second Christmas special. Um. Yeah, we, we, could, we could just we write this as, a, as, a, as the Christmas special after the season that we write now. Yeah, just yeah, just stop. Just stop. Um, but, write this down. Right, here's what I want to do for a Christmas special. A fourth wall breaking kind of but not really piece of event television, right? Okay. You, we as uh, sci-fi fans are going to be hugely aware of the massive fucking trope of aliens come to Earth hijack all the TV signals to send a message to humanity. You know, it's some, it's some alien leader's face with their fa uh, on all channels, uh, and you'll have, like, like in Bill and Ted. Uh, Bill and Ted 2, actually. Have you seen that one? Uh, no, I haven't seen that one. Like, like the silence in... Yeah, like, kind did, of like the silence. In season 6? Yeah, they did, yeah. There are loads of examples of this. I think it happens in the Sarah Jane adventures as well. Uh, I'm sure it's happened to Doctor... Yeah, the Atraxi did it. The Atraxi hijack, and in the 11th hour, they hijack all the TV signals and radio signals to talk um, directly to humanity. Um, and Stolen Earth as well. Oh yeah, Stolen Earth, kind of. It's not hijacking the TV signals, but it is pretty no, it similar. Like, yeah, it is pretty similar. But um, we invoke that trope, right? But the entire Christmas special is supposed to be this, the TV signal getting hijacked by the aliens, but then the Doctor appears on the ship with the aliens that are hijacking the, uh, the signal, um, and the entire story is told as the recovered, like, this is what you would have seen on Earth when your TV signal was hacked. That's quite cool. And it's... That's kind of like, that's kind of like, did you see the um, live episode of Inside Number 9? 
Uh, I didn't, but I saw your video I... on it. Yeah, yeah, where it's like, um, it's it plays out as in the ghost is hijacking the TV broadcast and showing lots of weird cursed footage. Yeah. But essentially, that's kind of, yeah. That's kind of similar, that's kind of similar to um, my idea for the, um, my idea for a Dalek story, um, which I come up with. Should I, should we, should we just start spitballing ideas now? I mean, um, I, I, feel, I want to go one idea at a time, I think. You've got this written okay. down, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, and the only reason we're doing this one first is because it could fit in as the Christmas special directly after our previous season, but probably won't. But we can keep it there for, for now, I guess. And yeah, yeah. So, um... Yeah, because it's got to be in keeping with, um, you know, the Doctor just coming off the back of a death. Yeah. Um, so the yeah the entire episode take and you, this is a great um a great setup to have loads of meta jokes um you know how one of the biggest trope lines when aliens hijack uh tv signals is we have hijacked all channels you know that that kind of thing we are controlling what you see you yes. see people flip over the channels and it's on uh you know it's on every channel right have the alien uh say we have hijacked every channel and have another alien uh, run up to it and go, never mind, we've just got the one. <laughs> Please don't <laughs> switch over. <laughs> I think that might be kind of a bit too much. Yeah, I think this would have to be the second Christmas special because it would be, it would definitely be funny and playing about with, Yeah, it, it would definitely be more a comedic episode. I think it fits with the Doctor having a, an established companion. It doesn't work as a Doctor w arriving on his own kind of a story because yeah, there needs the outer, to be someone the, for the, the Doctor outer, to talk the to. Outer, the outer limits, yes, that was what I was making reference to person in the comment section. Well done. But yeah, the entire episode would take place as, as a runabout where um, the Doctor is trying to keep the, the camera away from the aliens so they can't do their broadcast for whatever reason. Um, yes, this would definitely be more a um, silly one. Yeah, I'm mostly I'm mostly saying that because I am aware of how you can't really have like a very serious episode right next to a very jokey one. Yeah. Despite the fact that we have found ourselves with a Christmas special right next to a um very right next to a very serious episode because that I think is why people hated Love and Monsters so much mm. because it came right off the back of the Satan pit. Well, it's also bad. Yeah. It... Well, I've watched it, and it's it's kind of charming. I think. I mean, that's. Like, I feel like that's the. It's not as bad. It's not as bad as we all remember it being. Like we all remember being. T we all remember watching it at the time and thinking, "Oh my god, this is so terrible." Well, but I watched it back, and that's because it's... it was at the time the worst episode of New Who. And when you hear uh, frequently that, "Oh yeah, that's the worst episode," you remember it as, "Oh, it's the worst episode." It must be, you know, beyond redemption. But there weren't that many pure just trash episodes of the show then that's true although although i think fear her is much worse really yeah i, I can totally I, said, fear her. I said i said i watched monster, i watched love and monsters like because um the other year i made a couple of I made a couple of videos which are top tens like best and worst doctor who episode episodes of new who and i ended up watching love and monsters because i remembered it being bad but I ended up just sort of finding it inoffensive and kind of cute. Yeah, you know, it's a bunch of you know, it's about a bunch of people who meet up to talk about the Doctor. I and... certainly think that now that we've had uh, twelve seasons of the show, uh, it's very reasonable not to include it on a, a top ten worst episodes list. Even you know, but even a few seasons ago, it would have been you know, we had Kill the Moon by then by when you were making that video. Yeah, right? someone in the someone in the comments just put BJ paving slabs too. Yeah, yeah, I just find that funny now. That is just I mean, honestly. I've just I've just had I've just had too much distance from it's it. It's funny. Really. It's funny. Bad though. It's like it's not. It's not good for the reasons it thinks it is. But it's it it just makes me laugh. That's uh, that. I I can't really have that much hatred towards it. It just makes me laugh. It's it's the same reason why I didn't think Orphan Fifty Five was nearly as bad as people said it was. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um... Okay. Um, I just want to make. I want to say that in. Um, do you think we could get a, away with a joke this meta in the um, in the aliens hijacking the TV signal uh, episode? Is if we have the Doctor 
say to his companion when they've run away with the camera, the companion going, won't this cause like mass panic on Earth anyway? You know, even if we manage to um, get the aliens going away, won't, won't the fact that they're, they've received a signal from all these aliens uh, cause mass panic on Earth? Don't we need to do something about that? And the doctor goes, oh, we can... Oh, you know, if, as long as the aliens don't land, I'm sure they'll just be convinced that it's some weird TV show. <laughs> yeah, this is this is definitely the silliest idea we've had. This is the silly meta episode. But the thing is, that dialogue time, makes sense in context. He totally would say that, but it's also a comes, massive meta joke. Yeah, and this comes and, and this is, this is in a, in the in a show called. Yeah, we say we say that it's quite a heavy, depressing iteration of Doctor Who that we come up with. But we have had Happy Time. We've had Tomorrow's World. They're quite yeah. fun. We we started our series fun and light, and then we went. Uh, more and more serious as we went yeah right um okay could we could you we could just play our christmas special as essentially the first episode of our season two and use it to introduce our new companion and just play as just like a fairly standard straight doctor who story but you know with a much grumpier uh sadder doctor than last time that is true um and i've um, I, I have actually had an idea for an episode that would introduce a new companion. Um, well, I guess uh, we should talk um, about who we want our new companion to be. Yeah, what what sort of companion we would have? Because I was thinking, because uh, I was thinking going into this, well, would we want a more grown up companion to fo to follow on from the Doctor coming across coming across the um, <coughs> the uh, much younger? God, can't speak. Um, would we want to have a, the Doctor going for a slightly older companion? I'd, I'd say more in like the Donna mold. I'm, I, I'm not sure about age. I, 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 I would certainly could be an older companion. I'm thinking though that uh, more about the role that this companion wants to play in the Doctor's life. What would the actual relationship will be? I think now that the Doctor is very broken by the previous companion. We want a companion that could make him essentially learn to trust again. Yeah. We want someone who that he can have a very, like, um, a very, just a very good bond with. Like, you know, um, by the end of their relationship, when they've spent a couple of seasons together, these are people who know each other inside and out and would absolutely depend on each other. Yeah. For that reason... Uh, and because the Doctor, I feel, would be more reluctant to take on a companion at the moment because he uh, killed his last one, essentially. He, he sees it that way. Essentially, yeah. Um, I, I, would, I feel that the best kind of companion is a companion who has nowhere else to go, so has to live in the TARDIS with the Doctor. So, essentially, this is someone who's like whose society has nothing there for them anymore or uh, is in the process of collapsing when they leave. Do you uh, say that you want a homeless companion? Yes, I want a homeless companion. Absolutely. Hmm. I, want, I want a companion who's, who loses their home in their opening story and has to stay on, on the TARDIS with the Doctor. Um... And do, do we want to do multi, multiple companions? Uh, I, okay, I feel like we want one main companion and then like a recurring character like Captain Jack or something. You know, along those lines. Sorry I'm, sorry, I'm being quiet. I'm just thinking. That's allowed. Someone's, someone's putting in the comments, gambling addict. Do we want a Doctor Who companion who's a gambling addict? Um, okay, um... Oh, okay, I'm just uh, okay. I'm just going to say it about um, my idea for an episode that would introduce a companion. Okay, um, I'm currently writing a novel um, with a with a kind of Doctor Whoish premise, which I, can't, I kind of think could fold into it. Um, I'm just going to tell you. I'm just going to tell you the premise of the novel. Okay, um, okay. This guy's a businessman, right? He's um, and he's going on a flight to New York uh, for because he's got to meet some. He's got to meet someone for a conference in the morning. Um, and then about halfway through the flight. Um, the pilot just randomly announces on the t announces on the intercom, uh, "We're sorry, uh, we're going to have to have an emergency layover in Myloja," and the guy's just like, "Wait, what country's that?" 
and the plane and the plane and the plane has an emergency layover and they have to land the plane and get all the get all the people off the plane and the guy's just sort of like what country am i in like this country has completely appeared out of nowhere i really he's like got, that and he's stuck so he's stuck in this airport and he's like learning little tidbits of this um tidbits of what sort of country this is outside and there's all these hints that the country outside is like this fascist dystopia and it's going on outside the airport but he's only ever gets little tidbits of information about it and he's and he's still trying and he's trying to get hold of an internet connection because he can't figure out why he's never heard of this country before right so there's like hints that this country has managed to erase itself from the world outside its borders I like that. Is it is it supposed to be a real country that's just keeping quiet then? Yeah, sort of like North Korea, but it's managed to like it's managed to erase itself from all of history outside the world. I was hoping for like a big yeah. sci-fi answer. I I, I don't know. I... Well, that, well, that's the thing. It's a, that's the thing. The novel is in very early stages right now, but this is the novel that I'm writing. But it is very cool. It's a very it's such a it is such a Doctor Who premise of what the hang on what. There's a, wait, so there's a new country that I've never heard of before, and it's just appeared out of nowhere. It's very big finish. I think it's much more big finish than it is the main show. Yeah, because it is a very like high concept sci-fi story. Yeah, but my my idea my idea would be like my idea for it would be like that's how that that's how the Doctor meets a new companion. Like they're a business they're a business person traveling suddenly get laid over in this country that's appeared out of nowhere as a uh, appeared out of nowhere that's I don't know aliens are responsible for it in some way and like meets the doctor while laid over what is the I really like the story but I feel like it would work better as a mid-season thing yeah I like, really I, like, I really I mean... do want to include this I really like I like this is a premise that's like oh my god I what's gonna happen um but I yeah, feel like, like this would yeah, work. Maybe an, maybe an incidental, yeah, maybe an incidental character rather than an int introduction of a new I companion. I feel like this could be like our recurring Captain Jack type person. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, um, I do like the... Um, someone was talking about having a companion who's a gambling addict. I do like the idea of this business person being a gambling addict. And sort of like that. So they're stuck in the airport and they can't get a Wi-Fi signal and they're like, oh God, I want to play my... I want to pl play online poker. Oh, what if they... What if this character has, um, you know how there's like, it's established that, um, that I, I, I'm, I'm, that it's, that there's like aliens living on earth in secret now in Doctor Who. What if this yeah. was a flight that's, uh, supposed to be only a, a, a boarded by aliens? Um, yes. And it's going to another planet through some space hole. Uh, yeah. They have and to, yeah. And so, and, so, and so that's how it winds up in this country that no one's ever heard of before. Because it's an alien country on a different planet. Yes. And the, the like the, the foliage around that's visible can be weird enough, but uh, not so weird that uh, the person instantly goes, oh, I'm an alien. I'm on an alien planet here. Yeah. So it's it, it's it's sort of like just just weird enough. Yeah. And we've already established that there are entire alien cultures of people who look perfectly human in our previous season where uh, uh, we had uh, aliens kidnap humans 200,000 years ago and that's why there are aliens that look like humans everywhere. Yeah, because um, oh, in, the, in, the in the novel which I'm working on, the guy, the, air, the airport, because most airports look pretty much exactly the same anyway, so he's coming across all of these fixtures that he recognizes like Burger King and a Starbucks and he's just sort of like this is so familiar but it's so alien at the same time. Oh, I love the idea that I mean we we, we wouldn't get away with that on the BBC. Well, no, cuz you know, corporate product placement. But we we don't we even haven't even established if we're on the BBC, we could be a, a streaming service or something that's bought the rights after the BBC went under. Or we haven't fuck it. You, you, we can do it. We're allowed. We've got a dead actor in the lead role. We can do this. <laughs> yes. Um, I think this. Is, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm agreeing with you now. I'm thinking this is sort of like a mid season. I want to call it like let's call it episode five for now. Yeah. Should we just call the episode My Loja? Um, the novel I've called uh, the novel I've called uh, the novel I've called it. Um, do you know the Twilight Zone episode? Where is everybody? 
Is that the... No, I don't. I've, I've not um, seen any Twilight Zone, actually. I want to. The first episode the first episode that ever episode of the Twilight Zone is called Where Is Everybody? And it's about a man who just so- suddenly everyone around him disappears. So I've I've kind of take I've kind of taken inspiration for that with the novel's name. It's called Where Am I? Oh, that's cool. I like that. That's a very Doctor Who episode title as well. It's a very new Who episode title. Yeah. Uh, right. So we've got that. I'm I'm penning that in as episode five for now. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking it's a two part. I'm not sure though. Episode yeah, five slash six. I nearly typed slash sex. But the, the <laughs> e is nowhere near the I. I have I'm no child. excuse for that. That was just a reflex, I guess. Do I write sex significantly more than I write six? Uh, okay. Yeah, T- when I was... I, I, I keep on like adding bits to that novel uh, uh, over and over again as I continue on. And I, I it took me ages before I realized that because the country I've come up with is called my loger the first three letters of it are m-i-a i realized that the airport code for it is m-i-a as in missing that's pretty cool okay and their current their currency is called my something dollars which the acronym for it is m-a-d mad as in i'm mad i can't remember what country this is so okay um to introduce our companion i've got a premise as well that i think might work uh, okay, right? Because this this gives us the essentially this companion has nowhere else to go, so essentially the doctor would be doing a bad thing by not taking them on board, uh, and that outweighs that. Oh, I don't want to take on a new companion right now. I just killed one. Essentially, um, I like the idea that our doctor's slightly resentful towards the idea of having to have a new companion. Well, yeah, he, I think our doctor is. Uh, feeling essentially um, blaming himself for killing someone uh, and does not want to take someone else into that same world again. He wants to travel on his own and doesn't want to involve other people in it because he is a terrible influence and that's how he sees himself. Well, he's sorry, not not that he is a terrible influence, that he sees himself as one. Yeah, and I think theme- I, th- I think thematically this kind of works because you know people get resentful because you know people get resentful when you talk about the homelessness situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so for episode one, I think we set this on. We've already established that two hundred thousand years ago, humans were kidnapped and sold and sold as slaves, right? Yeah. These uh we have um two people who live alone uh well, not alone as uh the only two human slaves in an alien uh like colony. And one of them is terminally ill. The other one becomes our new companion when the first one passes away. Right? Right. Uh so the story itself is... I, I want to make this sort of like little kind of a cute thing. Um, so and it, it's quite dark, but just like it's it's up note dark. This could be the Christmas special, actually. Um, if we want to push it earlier and ha- introduce our companion in the Christmas special instead of episode one of this series. That's an idea. It's sort of like Christmas on another planet. Yeah. Christmas in an alien colony. Yeah, except it's it's some other festival that's celebrated by aliens. So right, we have. Um... Can I call it Chris Tide? <laughs> that just sounds like a person. No, Chris, Chris Tide is a reference to um, Rob's for, uh, Rob Sherman's first ever play. The 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 festival or I'm, like the play? I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the fa- the festival. Um, yeah, Rob's first ever play um, is. Um, it's a uh, qu- it's a family drama, but set in a universe where the Nazis won the war, and instead of celebrating Christmas, they call it Chris Tide. Dope. All right. So um, in this uh, this culture, the um, that own slaves, uh, right? We've got two human slaves. They live together and have to do work for their masters, as kind of is generally the done thing with slavery. 
um, they uh, right they um, one of the the older guy um, he is uh, terminally ill and not really capable of working anymore. So he just sort of gets to sit around in his like living space. Uh, I say gets to it's not not a great life, but what he really enjoys is when the sun rises. He loves feeling the sun on his face through the window. A rule for slaves in this culture, so that they don't mass together and rebel, is that they are not allowed outside. They that are... fits with lockdown. It does fit with lockdown. Yeah, I don't. I don't want people reading into the symbolism though that that lockdown is like slavery. That's not no, the message true, I want to send, yeah. but I'm okay with it. I, you know, it's I, I, it's not the intended message. I, I feel like... Okay, so... Um, the, uh, the... So, okay, humans are not allowed outside, um, or any, any slave class creatures are not allowed outside, outside on this planet, or in this culture. Not on, maybe not the whole planet, you know. Um... And these are the only two human slaves there. Uh, because they're not allowed outside, the older guy, his one of his main aspirations, because he loves feeling the sun on his face through his window, is to feel it without the glass in the way. He wants to feel the sun on his face, you know, in actuality rather than through the, the glass of his, his window, right? The doctor shows up. Um, they have a runaround because he looks human and... They therefore, uh, these aliens would assume that he is a slave. Even like, actually, I'm not sure how it worked that with there only being two human slaves there. I guess they can't tell humans apart. Let's go with that. Uh, and then they would assume that he is a human slave. Or let's say that this is just a culture that any non, you know, it's it's essentially an ethno culture where any anything that isn't the uh, native life form is assumed to be a slave and therefore not allowed outside, right? Yeah. So, um... <laughs> Sorry, just... Someone in the comment section just wrote Doctor goes to Planet of the Karens. <laughs> call it that. Let's call it that for now. Episode 1, Planet of the Karens. <laughs> so, um... What, mate? What, so, what, what, so, like, this, um... So, like, the, rule, the ruling race on, um, on this planet, the Doctor just nicknames Karen. They're called the Karens. The car ends. Yes. Uh, this, this, there we go. This car ends. Um, are we gonna leave this elaborate joke in? It's not that elaborate actually, but I guess we can for now, at least. Um, yeah, not spelt. Not spelt. Car. Not spelt. Karen. Obviously, but obviously it's. Uh, obviously, like there's like like there's apostrophes in there or something, but the I've doctor put, pronounced it Karen. Karen. I Karen. K I. A R apostrophe A N S. That's nice. Uh, okay, so the Kiarans see anything that um, it's it's an ethno culture where they buy slaves from other planets, um, and anything that isn't a Kiaran is assumed to be a slave. So the Doctor is going to be assumed to be a slave as well, and not allowed outside. And try, and they're going to try and put him in work you know, and stuff like that, you know. Um, he uh, meets these two human slaves on this planet, um, the terminally ill one and the able-bodied one, who will become our new companion. Should we give them a name and a gender now? That seems convenient. Mildred. <laughs> I swear that was your go-to name last stream as well. <laughs> I have this. I have this problem. Whenever anyone asks me for a name, I just say the stupidest thing that comes to mind. Sorry no, to no anyone offense. called Mildred no in the chat. To any, no offense to any call Uncle Mildred. Um. Right, everyone in chat, uh, give names. Give names that a person might have. I always have this problem when it comes to names. Should, I guess it shouldn't be a a traditional francophone. <laughs> I guess it shouldn't be like a, a traditional, you know, Western culture human Wilfred. name, because this is a a person who's grown up completely separate from any Earth culture, so it probably Audio shouldn't be tech. a it probably shouldn't be a normal 
a normal human name. Hang on. Alien name generator. But it should be something... It should be something normal enough that people don't hear it and go, what? I don't want to call them Sork. Sork. <laughs> Sork. I want to call them... If we give them, like, just a, a, a single syllable name, basically any single syllable sounds like it could be a name. Quentin. All of these... Hang on. Fantasy name generator... Lorembly. I've seen one in there that I like a lot. Artu. I've never heard that as a name before. I could believe it as a name, though, and that's exactly what I want. Something that Lot I've never heard of as a name, but could believe. Lotat. Are people just suggesting Pokemon names? <laughs> I, I want the kind of thing where if Cut. someone introduced... <laughs> Zed. I want the kind of thing where if, if someone introduced me themselves as this, I wouldn't be like, wow, that's a, a very strange name. But uh, that I've not heard as a name before, which is why I like Artu. Although I, I could believe that is a real name. Tuna. Orinoco. Sorry, I'm just opening Pokemon Go and looking at names now. <laughs> I've just revealed that I still play Pokemon Go. That's allowed. Omanite. <laughs> <laughs> Someone in the chat just put Jar Jar. <laughs> Lawn. 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 I quite like Lawn. Lawn? Lawn. Oh, Lawn. I like that too. I'm going to go with Lawn. Is this for the um, the lady or the man who's dying? Uh, I think this will be the lady. We've seen... Okay, it's a lady then. That hasn't yeah. been established, but we've decided it now. Okay, we decided it's a lady. Uh, Lawn is our lady. Ray Skywalker. <laughs> Um, right, so, and then there's an older man who is also enslaved with her and he's dying because this is, cool. thick, because mm. we're writing this and it can't be cheery. That's not allowed. Called Mace. Mace? Yeah, people put, people put in Mace. I'm guessing people are just suggesting Star Wars names now. Uh, sure, let's call him Mace for now. He's, he's never going to show up again, but. <laughs> yeah, he's just, he's just there to make the audience cry before he dies. So, um. The premise of this story is that he wants to feel the sun on his skin uh, before he dies without a window in the way. The episode is a big, you know, run around and them trying to get that for him. Um, they want to, they're trying to sneak him outside. The Doctor and Lorne are trying to sneak him outside uh, before he pass, you know, before he passes away. And they end by managing to get him outside and he gets outside with the sun on his face and goes, you know what? It feels the same as it did with the glass there. I'm glad we did it, though. And then immediately they get arrested by their lord and masters and the guy dies. I, I mean, him dying is, I feel, is, has got to be how it well, ends. Him, him, yeah, well, yeah, him dying is the inevitable bit, isn't it? Um... But then Lorne is left, you know, going, you're a traveller, can you take me away, please? I would rather not be a slave anymore. And the Doctor's like, yeah, that sounds very reasonable, I suppose. So now we have... Yeah, I like, I like him sort of being emotionally blackmailed into it. Yeah. So now we have the Doctor with a companion who is a live-in companion. Like, with yeah, no, living... nowhere else to go. Who's a living companion and is from another planet. Yes. I, I have felt that is a missed trick that um, New Who ha hasn't, really done, hasn't really done up until this point. Because you can play up how that companion is kind of unfamiliar with Earth customs. Yeah, we can, we can have an episode where we take this companion to Earth. And the fun is just that they haven't seen Earth before. Uh, so right, well, yeah, we've got uh, we've got our episode one. Uh, I I'm happy with it. Yeah, I'm happy with it. Um, so we've got uh, uh, two human. <laughs> Have a doctor with no head. <laughs> what? Huh? 
This is why I love having uh, a chat box on these things. Yeah, the chat is, the chat is, uh, is a marvel to behold. James Corden for the 16th Doctor. <laughs> no. <laughs> James Corden recast as the 6th Doctor. Then again, I suppose the Doctor has does have this history of regenerating his people that he's met before. Oh, God. It just reminded me that the Doctor canonically knows James Corden. Yeah. It, what, isn't he... What, what's his character name in that episode? Craig. That episode? Craig. Yeah, not, I, love, I love that you forgot it was more than one, and you're like, oh, yeah, there was more than one. There's two of them, yeah. See, in theory, I love the idea of revisiting characters occasionally like that. I feel like it's a missed trick to have more recurring characters in Doctor Who. Um, Wait, maybe that could be this this series shit episode because bring back Craig, yeah, bring back Craig. Yeah, because yeah, because we did establish that at least one episode of series has to be shit. So, what we do need to establish in our first episode, though, is the 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 uh, is the Doctor's starting point for his arc this season. Uh, establish the Doctor's feelings. He's just lost someone. And he blames himself. So right. his art this season is learning how to trust himself again. Yeah. And right at the end of the season, I want to give him a low point, and that's when, when Adric comes into it. Um, so. Uh, is Adric a ghost in this? He, um, he, spoilers. spoilers. Well, he's not He's not alive. Yes, I, he's, okay, I, I, right, he's not I literally there alive. I'll, I'll say that all right, much. I, or, or, or I, I will, I will wait. But I do want to bring back Matthew Waterhouse. Like this is, he is coming back. He's not being de-aged either. Um. So, um. <laughs> he blew up the Cybermen with love. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Adric did. So, um, one thing I want to do this season is uh and i, I kind of want to do this in any subsequent seasons we do if we carry on doing this which would be fun um is that have would be fun i enjoy the fantasy of being in charge of doctor who yeah that is it is beautiful All this power and people listen to it for some reason as well but one thing that i think works really well uh or would work really well in doctor who as a context right you know the problem with stories that put earth at stake you know they're not going to destroy earth Right? You know yeah. there is no way ever that Earth is getting destroyed in Doctor Who unless it's for like a cliffhanger where they have to bring it back or something and that's the, you know. But there's no way that Doctor Who is ever permanently destroying Earth because the understanding of Doctor Who is that it's going to go on and you don't do something that, you know, the Doctor, the TARDIS and the Earth are all safe uh, in terms of Doctor Who because they are the core premise of the show and they're, they're never going to be destroyed. Right. Yes. So, um, I think what we should do is um, fork out loads of budget on some expensive um, sets and alien costumes and keep coming back to them as a recurring setting and world build the shit out of a new setting which can we can threaten and the audience might actually buy that we destroy because we might. This is a, a new recurring setting that will world build and uh, and might destroy in the end. And and we'll have like maybe two or three episodes set there this season. Okay. Um, I'm picturing a... That actually... Hmm? That actually kind of fits with my idea for the Dalek episode. We could set the Dalek episode there then. That's an idea. Okay, okay should I tell you my idea for the Dalek episode? Um... Yes, but as like like I, that will be the discussion that we are about to have. But I also want to spitball what the setting will be. Are, are there any requirements of the setting for the Dalek episode? Um, no, I'm guessing. But I'm guessing this. I'm guessing that this setting will be like because we've established that we've established why humans, what why the universe is populated with humans. So we got an Earth-like planet, but not actually Earth, right? I want to have um, alien, like visibly alien. Um, natives um, close enough to Earth that you don't have to build, you know, that you don't have to CGI it every time. Basically, you could go to a beach somewhere, 
put up loads of fake looking, put up a few fake looking alien trees, not fake looking, they, they're they not supposed to be fake looking, but you know, put up a few um, fake alien trees in the sand, um, color grade the sky so it looks a different color, so the, you know, the light looks a different color and stuff. This, and this it's is a believable alien planet. Alien series then. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah, because yeah, last, last series has been like very earth focused, so this will be very alien focused. I guess so. Um, I want to call the planet. I want to name the planet after my main, after my home planet and my playthrough of Stellaris. We're calling okay. it Sogotioa, <laughs> but Sogotioa, Sogotioa, Sogotioa. Yes, Ioa, Sogotioa, Sogotioa. Okay, I'm cool with that. Um, alien natives. Um, that you know, it, we would essentially. I like the idea of for aliens hiring people with uh, a certain physical thing in common, and then process, pros, you know, giving them loads of prosthetics as well. So let's say you only hire people under five feet tall, but then you give them like arm and leg extensions, and you've got essentially an alien race with consistent proportions that are a similar size to most people, but look different proportionally. And uh, that, that's how I'd want to do something like that. Uh, alien population. Should we give that species a name now? Mildred. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's take the word Mildred and turn it into a, uh, a, a believable alien name. Mil... Mildrens. Sure, that's, the that Mil works. The Mildrens. The Mildrens. <laughs> The Mildrens, that works. But that, to be fair, that sounds like they're from a place called Mildra. Mildrads. Mildreds. Mildra Mildrads. Uh, they're called Mildrads. Um, culturally, I want them to be pretty chill. I want this to be a culture that we would be sad if, if it got lost. Uh... Pretty sim yeah, sympathetic. So it's like close to human, but not quite. I want this to be a culture that in the last 20 years has been contacted by aliens and they are now like... Um... Okay, okay, let's set the culture right. Um... This is a culture that has always known that there's life beyond the stars because on their planet are alien shipwrecks. Like a couple of alien shipwrecks which they discovered ages ago so the idea of life out there is not a shock to them, right? But yeah. they were—they actually had a proper first contact maybe 20 years before our first story with them. So they are all, um, they're be they are just being welcome to the, like, the galactic stage, but they don't have like that level of technology themselves yet. They're in contact with a, like a big, you know, like alien civilization somewhere out there, but they themselves don't have spaceships and all of that stuff. Yeah, I like that. Um, new contacts. Uh, new about aliens forever. We could even, if they have um, ruins of spaceships on that planet, we could set uh, a story about the alien ruins there. That could be cool. I like that. I like alien ruins stories. Then I feel like they're underused. Yeah, that are just sort of there. Yeah. It's like it's like how like it's like how like a um like if you live in say Egypt, the the locals are just sort of, the locals are just sort of desensitized to the fact that there there was there's there's all these ruins of ancient civilizations there and they're just tourist attractions now. Exactly. So you could have like you know these huge crashed like space freighters there that all of the locals are just used to. Although maybe not that huge because the budget, but you know what I mean. Unless you know, we could have establishing shots of them and then not have them in the background that often. Um, and this would be quite good because we've got this um, slave character, this companion who was a slave, and the doctor's taking taking her to all these planets and showing like tourist attractions. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So this this is going to be our setting for two or three stories, I guess. Yeah, certainly this season, uh, and we'll we we'll come back we to it. Can we introduce this episode, either episode two or three? I don't know which. 
Episode 2 makes sense to me. I'm going to grab a drink quickly. Um, my kitchen isn't far away. I live in a, a, a flat. So I'm just... Say things to the chat until I get back. Violate TOS. As many okay. times as hello, hello, chat. Um, the cheddar trees shall rise up. Does cheese grow on trees in this universe? Um, uh, okay, we'll say that tr tr cheese grows on trees. The, the candy man, <laughs> the candy man survived the time war and is the big bad of season finale. Um, I don't, I don't know if the can, I don't know if bring back the candy man. I, I, I quite like the idea of bringing back Megloss. You know, the, the talking cactus monster, which, which I definitely recommend we should do at some point in Hello. one of these. Hello. Uh, I'm talking about someone suggested we bring the back the candy man from Happiness Patrol in the don't. series finale. I've not seen Happiness Patrol since I was about five. Uh, so uh, I might have to rewatch that to, to fully understand the pitch. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. While, while, I'm, while we're on old enemies, I think because we brought back quite a lot of old enemies last season, are we going to be low on the amount of old enemies we bring back well, this time? The thing is, we were doing new things with them, and that's that was sort of. We, I don't yeah, think that's we the ever, bit, yeah. I don't think we ever did a story where it was just like, oh, let's do this again. Um, no, that's true. We took essentially the established world and used it to our advantage. It we we any viewers that have pre existing knowledge of Doctor Who will be rewarded with that knowledge because it will factor in. But we're doing stuff that's new. But we we're reestablishing these things so that um new viewers can also pick it up as they go. That is true, yes. Um Okay, so I I think we should I think we should establish this um establish this alien society like you said in episode two and have it be a sort of fun episode i okay i i am on board with that i do want to get an earth episode in early though to introduce our companion to earth mm, yes that's true i mm. i feel like you know do we, um, do we want us do we want a historical episode or a modern day one uh i think a modern day one I don't know. I I just pulled that out of my ass. I've not really got a premise or anything for it that I've that I've really thought about. But uh... okay, so we so, so shall we flush this out? Okay, so um, episode two we introduce we introduce this new alien society that's sort of like Earth that we thought of. Episode three, a more modern day Earth one. Yeah. Okay. So we need premises for those now. I'll look in my notes. What premises have I got written down? Uh. Why have I written light episode? What's that supposed to fucking mean? Because my where am I thing is sort of Earth adjacent. And I do agree with you that it seems more like a f episode 5-6 idea. Yeah, I, I, I do think that should be there. That could be... Uh... No, I was going to suggest that that could be one of the ones on our established planet, but that's not really one that you want to take place on. Actually, it could be an episode two, and that could be the episode that introduces us to this new planet. Although, we don't want them to be hugely space travelly, do we? No. Hmm. I'm trying to think. But I, I do feel that like the, the people there should have access to space travel, because they've made contact with a spacefaring race. But they don't have their own space travel yet. Hmm. Right, so episode two is on Sogotioa. You know what? That, that feels a bit too many vowels. Uh, just Sogot? You know what? I prefer Iwa. That's okay, only Iwa. vowel. That's only vowels, but fuck it. It's Iwa. That's just Iowa, isn't it? Iowa. Iowa, yeah. Yeah, alien planet Iowa. <laughs> um, right. Yeah, so. I'm looking at I'm looking at my um my um notepad of uh, notepad of idea uh, ideas, and most of mine seem to be like late season ones. I think. So do mine. <laughs> okay, actually, I've got one. I've got one that could fit here. I want to do a story called um, the Alien. What, just Set, the alien? It's just called the alien. Uh, <laughs> Dude, this planet is so goat. <laughs> what? Someone just said that in the, in the chat. 
Right, so the premise of the alien is um, the the Doctor and Companion, the doc, we can call her Lorne now, that's her name. The Doctor and Lorne land on a um, on, on Sagot Eoa, on, or, or sorry, on, on Eoa, where they um, they meet a local who instantly goes, ah, I know why you're here, um, and leads them somewhere. And they have no idea what the fuck the, this local has assumed they're there for, right? Um, and uh, the local does not look human, of course, because they're a local. The local takes them uh, on, on some public transport, I guess, takes them to a place of residence, knocks on the door, or does the alien equivalent, and out from the door steps a human person who, um, upon seeing the Doctor and Lorne, has an emotional outburst and is intensely happy. And the premise of the story is that they have been living on this planet as the only human and they don't know why they were left there as a, as a child. I like that quite a lot, actually. I don't know if this is a good episode two premise because it's quite similar to our episode one premise, which saw two humans living alone in a society of aliens. I feel like this is something we push back, actually. Yeah. I also feel like it's better to have Doctor and Companion know them know each other a little better before we do this. Yes. Hmm. But I do want to have this in here. Well, note it down anyway. We can chat. We can sw- We can. Um. We can flip about the order later. Um. Right. Yeah. I've got that. Got that down. How about. Uh... We want we want it either Earth or our new setting for our episode our episode two. Why have I written light episode? What was that supposed to mean? Maybe just a, maybe a, maybe that's supposed to just sort of mean we have something lighter because because we are working mostly on structure at the moment. Yeah. No, I, I wrote that in my in my notes for like pre this conversation. All of the other uh, notes. Are like episode premises. Um, okay, okay, okay. I'm, I've got loads of these premises in my. I, I used to have loads of these premises in my brain, but they've all escaped me because I'm really clever. And forget all my own ideas. Right. Let's have a, a quick look. See. J X C has a massive brain. No, that you're confusing me with Stephen Moffat. It's a ginormous brain orbiting the planet. Kill the moon. Right, let's have... No, that's not the right account either. If I was going to be a dick, I would suggest like a sequel to Kill the Moon in which we try and make sense of it. Oh, we just have the Doctor um, start walking around the TARDIS and, and the throwaway line says, And then I had a dr- dream that the moon was an egg. No, I mean, ge- no, I mean, genuinely try and make sense of it. That's impossible. You can't make sense of that episode. It doesn't work on any level. Hmm. The entire planet was taking mushrooms at the exact same time. It was a big holographic projection. Uh, designed to make the people of Earth reject scientific truth and go insane so that they would be... um... It was a movie pitched to a studio. Yeah, the Doctor stumbled into a a VR video game and didn't realise. Yeah, go on with that one. Right. um... Ah, episode... We're stuck at episode two, Stu. Well, we can uh, let's let let's okay 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 my idea let's spitball some let's spitball some premise fi- and figure this out later because remember remember last time we took till like right near the end to actually come up with our first episode. Oh, that's true. Okay, okay. I've got. Um, should we go back to the Christmas special? Okay. Because I've got a premise for that that I quite like that would work as a, a solo Doctor episode. Okay, go on. Um, the TARDIS. In flight, encounters a weapon. Let's say it's left over from the Time War, but that doesn't have to be explicit, right? Uh, it's a weapon designed to deal with TARDISes, right? You can't just destroy a TARDIS. What it does is it. Um, it this weapon uh, c- 
corrupts TARDIS navigation, right? And causes right. the TARDIS to only be uh, able to materialize in um, obscure and unlikely timelines. Okay. So the whole episode, and you could have the Rani in this as well. This is this this came from the idea of okay, what could, what episode could the Rani be in? Uh, and have have the Doctor discover that for ages she's been trapped in with her TARDIS, only able to go to obscure timelines, and now they're in this sort of like not alternate universe, but at like the edge of possibilities of our universe. Um, and it's essentially an excuse to have the Doctor keep materializing in different obscure timelines trying to find a way out um and so meet loads of... of really wacky shit that's really unlikely but that's the premise so, so this is sort of like interdimensional cable it is a bit like but interdimensional for cable but for, Do- but for doctor who i like that i really like the idea of having the doc- you introduce the it's fact so, that- it's sort of it's sort of like a doc- doctor who sketch show yeah but there's a serious through line where the Doctor's trying to escape the the obscure universe. I have... like that because it's. I like that because it sort of it, it it sort of it brings us a it brings us away from how heavy and dour our our final episode our final episode was, but it doesn't feel whiplash. Yeah, it, it, it has like enough. Whiplash. It has enough scope for our Doctor to be grumpy in it. I like yes. the idea of establishing that something's wrong by having the TARDIS materialize. The doctor not really wanting to go outside, but then there's a knock on the door. He opens it, and it's a cyberman asking him if he has time to talk about Jesus Christ. Because it's an obscure timeline that's really unlikely, and that's the point. It, this is a cyberman. This is a, a universe. This is a timeline where the cybermen became missionaries and uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. But it's all things like that. That's the episode is. Um, Maybe not that silly, but you know the kind of thing. Your life? Yeah, um, just trying to think of a title for it. Um, oh, that, hmm. Mormon Cybermen. <laughs> but yeah, that's the kind of, that's the kind of fucking around you'd want to do, although... You wouldn't want to essentially um, make a mockery of everything in the show, but you, you know it's a, it's quite a big finish thing. I feel like people who have only seen the main show are going to be like, "What the fuck are you doing?" But people who well, like people big bit, finish, well, where um, pe- people would be like this with most of what we've done so far, anyway. <laughs> people who like big finish with the uh, the you know the one Doctor and stuff like that will absolutely love this shit. Because if if you don't get the kind of thing we're going for here, go and listen to the Big Finish play The One Doctor. It's on Spotify for free, uploaded by Big Finish. It's a legitimate way to listen to it. Uh, so just go and listen there. It's really fun. The um, Cheddar Tree of Time. <laughs> I read that as you were reading it. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Um, yeah, is is this episode Christmas themed? I don't think so. I, I feel it's like just, we can have some Christmas references in it, but uh... we can have. Some, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like because because uh, because that did start to bug me as we got more and more Christmas specials during the Moffat era, which were very which felt more like episodes about Christmas than Christmas specials of Doctor Who. Yeah. Whereas with Russell episodes, it, with with Russell um, Christmas episodes, it, they they were just episodes of Doctor Who that happened to be on Christmas, like Voyage of the Damned and Runaway Bride, etc. Yeah, I, like they were set. They were Christmas specials, but they weren't about Christmas so much. Yeah, exactly. I do like the idea that the Rani has sort of um, being trapped in this world for so long, maybe mellowed out. I don't actually remember much about the Rani. I included her as a joke, and now I'm rolling with it. Um, but I do like the idea that she's kind of mellowed out and can take on sort of a role as former villain now, companion, but not really. For this single episode, you know they're trying. They've got a goal in common. They're trying to escape the obscurity universe together. In the in the in the chat, the obscure timeline is always on Christmas. How about uh, yeah? How about the one of the timelines is it actually is Christmas every day? Yeah, that that can be one of the timelines. That can be one of the timelines. Uh, 
that right? Let's write that down. I haven't got a title for it yet, but. Trapped in a obscure, unlikely timelines, thanks to anti TARDIS weapon. Doctor must escape. Also, the Rani is there. I'm really fast at typing. Best temp in Chiswick. 100 words per minute. Right. So, um, I'm happy with our Christmas special. Every day is Christmas except for April the 18th. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I like that because the go the obvious joke would be to say except December the twenty fifth. Oh, <laughs> the only day that isn't Christmas is Christmas. How wacky! But I much prefer that it's just a random day of the year. Uh, right. Um. Okay. Should we just spitball some concepts then, and just sort of. Uh, just sort of see which one sticks. Um, yeah, we will spitball got... our concepts for later episodes and see which one sticks as a concept for an... Uh, should we think about arcs? Are we doing an... Uh, is our arc this season just going to be the recovery arc, essentially? I think so, because I think so because last... Because our first season was that heavy. So yeah, this this season is our Doctor just recovering. Is, is um... The arc of the season is, it's just going to be self-contained adventures, but through them, our Doctor recovers from the previous season. Yes. Uh, so, what what's one of your premises? Okay, I'll, okay, I'll spit with you the um, Dalek idea. Okay, my idea is um, a... Um... A strange format episode, like um, like you, like you just, like you just um mentioned um, uh, an episode, an episode as an interrupted alien broadcast. My idea was to do a documentary, a, a documentary about that time that the Daleks invaded a planet, like made by people in the made by people in the future. It's like memories of when the Daleks occupied Earth. I do love. I love that. So it's like you've got like lots of archive clips of like rebels it, re like rebels um breaking into a dalek uh, into a dalek base and you uh, cut between like interviews of people talking about oh yeah it was terrible when the daleks um um when the da when the daleks invaded they took all over all of our broadcast stations etc so it's like a bbc documentary made by made in the future are like memories of the dalek invasion memories of the daleks i like calling it memories of the daleks um, yeah, and um, I like the. Should, are we going to have the? Is this going to be our Doctor Light? I would think so. Like the Doctor occasionally shows up in archive clips where, I... and, and it sort of get it. It sort of gets hinted at that that's how that that's how the Daleks ended up getting defeated in some way. I kind of prefer the idea that the Doctor's there in the interviews. Oh yeah, and he shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah, you're right. Yeah, the Doctor is there in the interviews. Yeah. Um. I'm, I just I'm I like considering I, whether he should be in the archive clips. Yeah, the um, yeah the main the main reason that this um popped into my, this popped into my head when I was uh, scribbling some ideas for us to come up with is I like the idea of their I like the idea of um a documentary crew, crew trying to piece together how the Dalek society works. I like the idea of them um yeah. breaking into it. The, I like the idea of them breaking into a Dalek facility and seeing the Dalek gestation process. Like the Dalek creatures being grown, I'm, and then implanted into the Daleks' heads. I'm considering whether Daleks. or not this goes on our our established alien setting or not, because I feel like if their only ever experience of aliens previously has been and them having to repel an invasion, they're going to be less much less optimistic now about their new first contact. Yeah, I'm not sure. I just, I, I just, I had the, I had the idea of doing it, doing a Dalek invasion like a documentary. But I do really like this because something I do want to do over the course of our seasons is build up to when the Daleks aren't just, you know, sort of there; they're actually back, right? You know, I, I yeah. want to build up to the oh, the Empire is actually here and we're fucked moment that is inevitably going to happen. 
Um, and showing that the Daleks used to be here but aren't anymore is a great way of doing that, I think. It's essentially going, yeah, they were around. We're not sure where they are now. And that that makes the implicit question, where are they now? Yeah. So, yeah, that's my idea. Do you think it's an early early episode or a late one? I think it works as an early episode, but not episode two. Episode three? I'm happy with calling it episode three. Like, hmm, do we want to introduce the setting before we... Uh, or is this our introduction to the setting? Actually, I think this works really well as an introduction to the setting. Seeing a piece of media yeah. that they've made. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say yeah, I'd say this is an episode three. Yeah, yeah, I like this as episode three, which makes episode two our Earth uh, episode. Yeah, episode two is our Earth episode. The episode three is our. This introduces our planet. Uh, right. So, Iowa. Episode three, memories. Okay, give, given this Daleks. Given, given this keeps on showing up in the chat. Should we just it, should we just have an episode where cheese grows on trees? You know what? That can be an obscure timeline. That, yeah, that can be an obscure timeline. Cheese grows on trees. Like, uh, yeah, someone is... in the comments saying "very live 34. Yeah, that was that, that was my main idea for memory. That, that was my main inspiration for ja memories of the Daleks. Memories of the Daleks. All right, so that's a um, the the episode is aired as a documentary uh, about the Daleks, made by an alien culture. But suspiciously fits the formatting of our TVs. Well, yeah, because well, well, yeah, because we've established that that's why we've we've established that base humans are across the galaxy. Yeah, but I doubt they're going to take our <laughs> our our uh, widescreen format with sixteen by nine aspect ratio is intrinsic to human DNA. No, it's 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 fine. It's yes, fine. it is. <laughs> That's how it works. No, but these aren't these aren't uh, these weren't going to be creatures evolved from humans anyway. These were the um, the the Mildred the Mildreds, the Mildreds. Yes, because I keep on saying the word Mildred for some reason. <laughs> exactly. Right. So um, I like I, I like memories of the Daleks. I like that as an idea. Um, it's a. The only yeah, concern I, wanna... I have for it, the only reservation I have about it, is it's a bit early to have a Doctor Light, maybe. Well, you said that you said that the Doctor would show up in the interview, so I, I'm not sure it would be that Doctor Light. It's just it's an experimental concept. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I feel like pushing it off to episode four. Then I don't know. Oh, it's a hmm. it's a weird thing that fit, that works better. It has pros and cons of it being in different places in the season. I think that's the thing, though. I do think it does work as an introduction to this um, alien society. Because it's sort of... The, the, the problem I have with having it so Cause early... Because it's, it's, it's quite organic. The problem I have with having it so early is it... It doesn't have any chance to establish a further relationship between the Doctor and the Companion. We essentially, we miss the, the Companion's second trip in the TARDIS where they choose to go. Because it, by nature of its premise, it being a documentary, it has to start with them already there in the interviews. So That's why I would that... prefer it to be later. Mm. Is that our episode four? I could even see it as episode five, but... Yeah, we I could think... shove. We, we could shunt. Where am I? Um, back back an episode. Yeah, I think this works as episode five, and then we introduce the setting some other way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm um, okay. I'm agreeing with that. Why are the earlier ones so hard? Um. Right. So I guess if we do want to talk about early episodes, then what's the kind of premise? What's a good premise for our... Cyberman uh... prostitution. <laughs> What's oh, a good uh, a good premise? Oh, do you think they'd wear cyber heels? Yes. I mean, they were, I mean, they wear cyber flares in the Russell T era. 
have um, have cyber prostitutes show up in the obscure timelines and have one uh, magically appear in the fort, slip into the main timeline, and that's where the cyber man, the cyber woman comes from, and that's why she has cyber heels and cyber titties. Remember when Chris Chibnall and wrote Cyber Woman? Wrote. <laughs> Do you, are you aware of H Bomber Guy? Yes. Do you, you know he talked about Cyber Woman briefly in his. Uh... Oh, did he? I can't remember. I think it's it was been in a while. his his Christmas special analysis of uh, Twice Upon a Time, which it's been a while with him. On the record, I disagree with his central point on where he claims that the episode has no stakes. Uh, because the because testimony isn't an evil alien threat. No, Harris. The stakes come from whether or not the Doctor will regenerate. That's it's a personal story, not an alien threat story. Shut up. But uh, yeah, in that he talks about Cyberwoman, and it's really funny to just see him like, yeah, go on about how they defeat the Cyberwoman by spraying her with a delicious sauce, <laughs> barbecue sauce. So that so the pterodactyl eats her. Oh, that was funny. Um, Cyber Woman. All right, so I'll, I guess I'll read off uh, one of my premises here. I like the idea of doing a very slow. This is. I feel this also fits being a two-parter. Uh, a very okay, um, slow atmospheric story, a la Satan Pit, but where the the uh, the goal. Um, the creature is trapped and trying to escape, but it never gets out. But uh, while the our TARDIS crew are there, they are at risk from it because they are within its reach. Uh, you know, it it has reach beyond its cell essentially, and uh, can uh, can cause harm essentially telepathically to the people who are trying to. Uh, so far, I'm just describing the Satan Pit. I realize that, but there are ways I want to make it different. So, uh, the TARDIS crew lands uh, and discovers uh, that they have landed on a desolate glacial world, right? So, everywhere is ice. Uh, it, it's just a big frozen world with oceans under the ice. Uh, and ice is... Uh, the entire surface of the world is ice. Right. right. Um might be expensive to film. I guess you might go to Greenland for it, or uh, ideally would be to just go to a real glacier for this. Don't know how expensive that would be, but uh, I've I've seen a glacier once. It was pretty neat. Uh, I go on it. They do. They do still exist. Yeah, they're they're around. I'm sure you can find one. Um, how about a, do a Doctor Who episode filmed in Antarctica? Dude, that on the marketing would do so well. Yes, that would that would be. Oh, wasn't wasn't Peter Jackson going to direct an episode of Doctor Who at some point? Yeah, he was. They even did a video Supposed with uh, Peter Capaldi where uh, baiting it, and then it never happened. Yeah, that was a shame. Um. All right, should we should we, should we say that then that we'd say that we'd say we'd have an episode filmed in Antarctica directed by Peter Jackson? Fuck it, yeah. <laughs> because if we're because if we're casting, but does he does he have horror? If we cast, because this is this is like what. I guess he does, yeah, because that's a, a lot of the Lord of the Rings is yeah, that's uh, where he, that, atmosphere, that's where isn't he it? Well, that's where he started. He started as horror. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, this is perfect for him. Then. Yeah, he, yeah, he did Brain Dead and Bad Taste. So, uh, the people that are uh, that uh, the Doctor meets on this glacial world are a small group of ice warriors. Right, and they have uh, left Mars as it was dying in suspended animation to try and find a new planet where they can build a new society because Mars itself is dying, right? So you've got this culture fleeing a dying planet uh, and they found this one, right? That's the, the premise, uh, you know. The, the Ice Warriors aren't hostile. They're like, oh, there are aliens here. That's unusual. How did you guys get here? Because, you know, this... Ice Warriors are a nuanced people. They're not just, oh, we must crush and kill all aliens. They actually have values and things they try to do. Uh, they're, they are like the Vikings, as Bill Potts said. They don't just kill everything. They have goals. Yeah. Um, 
And this is a group trying to uh, trying to find a new planet they can live on. Um, oh, someone in the comments just put "Bring back Frobisher for the Antarctica episode." It's really tempting, but I don't want to. I don't <laughs> want to fill that. We've already got like a lot of returning stuff, and I don't want it to just. I don't want it to feel like indulgent nostalgia. That is, yeah, I do agree. That's why I made that point earlier. Um, everything that I want to bring back, I want to have a good justification and essentially justify it within its own story. Yes. Um, so, okay, the Ice Warriors here are, you know, space travelers. Um, it's revealed at some... So, okay, uh, um, the stuff starts going wrong when individuals from this party trying to um, explore and survey the land so that they can figure out a way to start um, growing props, crops even, because they have like limited rations that will only last them a few years on their ship. Um, they, so they want to actually be able to build a society and survive. That's their goal. Um, individuals from this group start uh, going off the rails and... Uh, killing them, each other and themselves that and that's the issue right that's that's how you know something's up um and they they keep doing it after seeing this uh after seeing like light come out of the ice and the light essentially you know the light gets in their eyes and they kill each other uh so what we have is a um as the episode goes on, um, the Doctor tries to figure out how they knew to come here. Because this is a planet light years and light years away from Mars. Why did they choose this one? The uh, Ice Warriors show an artifact that they had discovered on Mars from a crashed Exelon spaceship. This also works in... Right. Exelons? Do you, do you remember the Exelons? I remember the Axelons. I'm using them here because it was established right all the way back in uh, Death of the Daleks in John Pertwee's era that the Axelons visited Earth in prehistory. So it's reasonable that they might have visited Mars as well. Um, right, and there's no... This isn't going to be... Uh, oh, hey, remember the Axelons? They may as well be a new race here, but I'm just using the Exelons because we know that they've been there and there's no reason to introduce something new when something that we already have fits the bill perfectly. Right? So, But these may as well be random new aliens. Um, yes. But it's an, a, dis, a crashed Exelon... There was a crashed Exelon ship on, on Mars from which the Ice Warriors discovered a... Um, a navigation, like, computer, like, a, a navigation chart. And on the navigation chart, there were several planets marked uh, with, like, a, like you know, with a, a marking that they couldn't identify because it was alien, right? And they decided that to, uh, because Mars was dying and they didn't have long to survey uh, new planets and try to find a new one, that they would just launch missions to all of these marked planets and... Um, hope that the markings were something good that the ice warriors would be able to survive there uh the doctor recognizes the marks as oh no these aren't oh this is a habitable planet the or you know this is an exelon civilization or something like that these marks mean danger stay away uh and on, right. this, on this planet is a um is some something is prison is imprisoned in the ocean, in the under the ice on this planet, uh, you could also have the um, remember the beacon from Destiny uh, from Death of the Daleks. I haven't watched Death of the Daleks in quite a long time. So in Death of the Daleks, they've um, the central premise of that episode of that story even that starts everything off is that there's a beacon that drains power, and it's this tall light. That goes bwom, 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 <laughs> uh, and everything around it loses power. Uh, 
I would want to have one of those uh, that's been built on this planet by the Exelons to, to drain the power from the creature that lives inside the planet and keep it weak. Um, How big is this creature? It large. But not like, no, not, you know, celestial scale. This is just a large creature. So it's not like the size of the planet and the planet is an egg. No. I don't want to remind our viewers of Kill the Moon. No. So, um, this could be a one-parter, it could be a two-parter. I have, I'm actually not sure. Give me your thoughts, I guess. But, um, essentially I want to build up to this creature for ages. Um, and this is, the whole point is that you never actually see it. Right? You see its silhouette moving under, you see its shadow moving under the ice and stuff like that. But I feel... This is a mystery story where the whole point is that it's never answered and you're going... And there are some mysteries that you never learn the answer to. Like in... Um, if, uh, if you've seen... Uh, oh, kind of like the Red Lady. Before yeah, before they went lady. back to it. Before they went back to it at the end, yeah. And the, whole, the whole reason it was so um, interesting is because you don't get all the answers by the end. You just know that there is something scary and they escaped it. And the, the sense of mystery is left there because it never gets explained. Kind of like in Blink as well, where you don't actually learn much about the angels. Yeah, this could be a two-parter. So This could be a second two-parter. Uh, I really like the idea of... Um... I, like the idea that, I like the idea that we've separated this out. So in the first half of the season, it's like small, high-concept type like stories, like, our, like my Memories of the Daleks thing. Yeah. Then we start introducing bigger ones, like Where Am I and Your Ice Warriors. Where well. Am I feels like a cool small-scale story to me. Mm, yeah, maybe. Hmm. Yeah, because it's, yeah, it's all set in the airport. Yeah, maybe Where Am I is a one-parter. I was, I, I was wondering like how you'd fill two parts of Where Am I? Because mm. there does need to be something more going on, I guess, to, to fill that, to make that like an hour, uh, an hour, oh sorry, an hour and a half of, of Yeah, because I was thinking that yeah, because I was mostly thinking that it's like the the first part is set all entirely inside the airport, wondering what's going on outside, and then the cliffhanger is like the cliffhanger sort of gets us moving into into um, finding out what's going on outside. But maybe you know it is what? a one. Right. I if we make where am I a one part story, we make the planet that it turns out to be uh, Eora, um, and the. Um, the space travel is run by the civilization that Iowa are in contact with. I like the idea then that that's our, yeah, that our episode two. Yeah, that works. Yeah, let's do that. Episode two yeah, is yeah, because it is sort of Earth adjacent that one, and it features like this business lady who gets her flight interrupted. Yeah. Yeah, that works. Yeah, I, 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 I a wanna... planet becomes a Pac-Man monster. <laughs> right. Um, so for, I guess then we can make episode six and seven the um... the Ice Warriors one. Yeah. So uh, in that we've got uh... that is that is quite love. It is quite a Lovecraftian idea as well. Yeah. You know, so... like you know, it's kind of like at the mountains of madness. I explicitly want the last scene of that episode. This like the last scene of that episode is like burnt into my mind. I can picture it really clearly. Or not the last scene, but like the the, the resolution is the doctor. You know how the doctor is driven by curiosity. Uh, you remember like you know David Tennant would always see the horrific alien creature and go, "Oh, you are beautiful." Yes. That kind of drive, right? Th throughout this whole episode, when the light gets in the Ice Warrior's eyes, um, the they've started going on a, a rampage when they when they actually like a, but i would always want to cut away before you see what actually turns them right light goes in their eyes cut away you don't know what happens next but it's implied that something is about to happen and then the next time you see that ice warrior they're killing right i'd want the yeah. last scene of the episode to be you see the light start coming out of the ice right they're fleeing to the tardis um, the surviving Ice Warriors are fleeing to the TARDIS where the Doctor has promised to take them away uh, and drop them off somewhere safer. 
Okay. The um, the uh, let's say there's a huge cliff in the ice, right? You know, like a, maybe a kilometer tall cliff. This is alien uh, typography. It can be a kilometer high cliff of ice if I want, right? And behind that cliff is some water, some ocean. Um, or it could even it could just be like a huge flat plain of ice. Uh, this is the first time you clearly see. Light, light. The light starts coming from under the ice. You know, the the ocean below it is glowing, and in the glow, you see the silhouette of the creature, and you can just make out its shape for the first time, and then you see the doctor's face as he looks at it, and then and then he gets pulled back by friends into the TARDIS, and the door closes, and that's the last scene. Is the doctor getting the best look at it you get, but still not a good look at it. That's what, and that's, that's that's the sense of mystery I want to convey. Is like you never find out what this thing is, but you see its that's not, shape so clearly in, in that's the light. That's nice, and the doc, the doctor gets to marvel at something. Yeah, but you also have yeah. the sinister like. So did the, did the killing light go in your eye, Doctor? Um, yeah, uh, I like that. You could then make the next story, an episode where you have to deal with the fact that the killing light is in the doctor's eye, but I don't, I don't really want to. I, I feel like I feel like the premise should be that the Doctor managed to get out just into... Like, I kind of want the implication of that ending to be the creature has been possessing people this whole time. Did its consciousness manage to escape in the Doctor when he looked at it? Is that is that what just happened? That could be a finale as well, is the, is, is hmm. it, the, the consciousness manifesting itself, but I'm not sure that I want to do that. I just, I just like the ambiguous note of. Hmm. So, did that go in you, Doctor? Hmm. I, ju- I'm just, I, th- I'm just thinking if I'm just thinking, yeah, I'm just thinking that would be quite cool to have like a two-part episode, a uh, two-part episode that ends with that, some um, with that, that question, and then the consequences of that go into the finale. I do like that actually. Should we make that the finale then? Should we make the, or should we just make, the- make this like a three-part story where the the third part is the consequences of the the previous two. I don't know. I kind of I feel like I kind of feel like it sort of devalues the mystery if we if we explore it further though. Have we don't have to explain what it is. We, are, we yeah we don't have to explain what it is. Just it's there. Hmm. It's Sutek. So then, the, so then the finale is like the companion mistrusting the Doctor. Oh no, I don't want to see that again. To be fair. No. Yeah. True. Actually. Um, I, hmm. I feel like because we're building the relationship between the companion Lorm and the Doctor for this. Um, season i feel like a good contrast to be would be if the doctor uh is possessed by this creature in the final episode but the companion knows it's not him and still trusts him completely afterwards and that really would cement their relationship sure that's quite nice you know i've sort of i know that wasn't you yeah so is this the finale then i i you know what I don't think so, though, because our mm. finale needs the Doctor to be a conscious player, so that he can, so that we can get his, um, the we can get the payoff of him being recovered, essentially, not completely. So but, th- you know, having so this is this is like a two part eight and nine. Then we get a couple. Then we get a couple more episodes. Then finale. I, I should. I... You know what? Okay. Here's how we do this. Those that could be episode uh, six and seven are uh, what do we call it? The uh, uh, beneath the ice. That's a nice name. And it has ice warriors in it, but the word ice isn't anything to do with the fucking ice warriors. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, right. So ice. Worry, light in the uh, eye, ending scene, 
ha has the light gone in the doctor's eye? Um, oh, I've written Ice, Ice Warriors. Um, Ice Warriors, the new cereal from Kellogg's. <laughs> I was thinking of like Wario and Waluigi. Uh, um, big. I was picturing the creature as like a big snake shaped thing, but not quite. Uh, big creature. Right, so I think we want episode 8 to be the companion persuades the doctor to actually go and get a checkup somewhere which the doctor wouldn't normally do. We, like, that's not a very doctor thing to do is, oh, I, th I should just go get a medical checkup now. So the companion's worried about the doctor's health. Yeah, the, do the, the doctor is the companion is worried the, the the light went in the doctor's eye, so persuades the doctor, and this this is a you know this can be a huge milestone in the relationship that the companion is able to persuade the doctor to do something like that, and also cares enough about the doctor to go, hey, can you like I think you should take care of yourself and go get checked, like go to find some civilization where they will know both what you are as a species and where they will um, have the medical technology to maybe figure out this kind of problem and see if it's actually there and the whole uh episode the next episode can be set in this alien hospital you know what so, the doctor is... hmm? so, so our, 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 our central point of this our central point of this season is the doctor recovering after such a traumatic event from the first season yeah so that, that's quite good then that we got the that we got this com the companion the companion is showing concern for the doctor's health here but it's all it's as well as it being like a physical health thing he's also got this men he, he's also got this underlying mental trauma that he's denying by continuing on into going and going on into these adventures yeah exactly but we do want i think we do want there to at some point in the season be the heart to heart where the doctor explains oh yeah i had a friend and she died and it was like i blame myself for it because I, um, I showed her the things that drove her to take risks, and the risks killed her. Yeah, I th I think that should come quite early in the season, because like um, I'm not sure if he opens up. Like, he should open up that early. Hmm. I'm not sure. I feel like the the hospital episode is the perfect episode to do it. Actually, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. Episode. So episode eight is. Uh, I set. think uh, I was mostly just saying that because I think there does need to be like a lawn heavy episode quite early in the season just to you yeah. know get the audience on side with her. Um, we've got four. We've got uh, three and four to fill with something, which we can we can use to characterize her quite well. Right, three and four to fill with something. I think one of them should just be um, a return to Earth and a fun, a, just a fun little Earth romp along the lines of World of Tomorrow, um, yeah, where true, we yeah. see the Earth through this human who knows that her people come from Earth but has never seen it or has any idea what it's like. See that? See the Earth through her eyes. Honestly, I could just watch, you know, I could just watch her experiencing the Earth for thought forty-five minutes. I would be really interested in. Because that's such a characterization for a character is how do they react to Earth when it's their you know ancestral home that they have no idea what it's like. Um, so should we just should we? I quite like that. So should we just have episode three like called Welcome to Earth? Uh, I feel like that should be episode four because. I don't want to use the same setting of Eowa for two episodes in a row and Memories of the Daleks are set on Eowa. So Welcome to yeah, Earth true. is episode four. Uh, the Doctor shows um, Lawn Earth. Yeah, because I, like, I, I do like Where Am I being episode two because it's, it, it's um, the Doctor rescues this um, slave character and um, takes, her off into the, takes her off into the universe and then episode two is immediately called Where Am I? That's a good. I like that. That's cute, actually. Yeah, I didn't realize that until just now. Um, 
It's um, like in it's like, it's like in our first season where we have um we have the doctor takes the companion off into time and space. Where are we going to go? And the episode two is tomorrow's world, and it's like the, the it's eight. set in, in 1983 in Slough. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. I like the idea of the story in this episode being just, um, just being Lorn doesn't understand Earth and sort of gets lost and stuff, uh, and needs um, is just you know ignorant to how stuff is done on Earth, and like you know gets in a scrape. Because she doesn't know what what people would assume that she knows. Oh my god! The, the, when you were saying that, my immediate my immediate thought, because I'm a morbid shit, was what if she gets kidnapped by a serial killer? That's the kind of thing, you know. Like <laughs> um, she's never far. she's never seen Earth before. Some guy comes along and goes, "Would you like to get in my van?" She goes, "Sure." <laughs> That's just that just shows how like warped my mind is. But you know, something lighter than that. Something lighter than something lighter. Know, um, Something than lighter that. than Lorne ends up in a Saw movie. Yes. So, uh, so like, like she falls for a scam or something, but she has no money to get scammed out of, so I'm not sure how that would work. Um, Lor- Lorne is on Facebook reading all this shit about fair, chemtrails. One of her things isn't that she would be overly trusting because she's been a slave her whole life. That needs to oh, that's true. define that's her point, character. Yeah. That needs to define her characterization. Um, you know, there's no like you know, like Finn was a stormtrooper in, and that you know, and then he escapes being a stormtrooper, and then he's just a goofball, and you're like, wasn't this guy a stormtrooper a few minutes ago? Um, so yeah, the fact that she's a slave needs to, or was a slave, needs to be something that you can sort of get from just watching her. Like you know, you could tell that Leela came from a tribal background, eat from watching any of her stories. You just got that impression from her. Lawn becomes an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> you could have, uh, you know, you can have though, like, um, she she um, orders food from like a, like you know, she orders some street, she buys some street food or whatever, um, tries it and says to like the vendor, "Oh, this is the most delicious carcass," and just you know, fish out of water comedy. I like that as a thing. I would like to congratulate you on preparing a most delicious carcass. <laughs> yeah. Because it's just like some sausages and stuff. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what she gets tangled up in, but I do want that to be the plot. I don't want it to be an alien plot. I want it to just be she gets tangled up in something on Earth because she doesn't know how it works. Um, how about this is a bomb threat? <laughs> Or is that a bit too dark? I feel like, I, I I feel like it's... A bit, I mean, how, first of all, how do you get tangled up in a bomb threat, is my question. No, my... <laughs> no, like, um, the Doctor takes her to like the Natural History Museum and there's a bomb threat and the building gets locked down. That could be a it's really just... nice way to contain a... a, a like a, a, a nice self-contained character piece, actually, where they just have to sit together and, and talk, you know... There wouldn't be much else to do in that situation. I guess the Doctor would try to solve the bomb threat. Could use the and psychic paper. Safe, yes. He could use the psychic paper to show that he's in like a bomb squad or something. And yes, yeah, oh, that's a really cool one actually. I like that. They they go to a place it's... and there's a bomb threat, and the Doctor has to uh, disarm the bomb. I yeah, guess so we it's... have to have mili- so it's cut it's. It's kind of, it's so it's kind of light, but not really. So it's not like my serial killer. I mean, it's like it's killer. like for Doctor Who. Yeah, it's like for our Doctor Who certainly. Uh, we want we need like a motive for the bomb threat. I guess could be financial. It could be uh, corporate sabotage. I like the idea of like a this is a business that they've gone to, and opposition have are trying to. Um, have a phone and a bomb threat to try and sabotage uh, an opposing business. I like that as the as the premise. Any objections to that? Objections to that. Uh, so that gives them time. Um, uh, okay, Doctor uses 
so you click paper to show he is on the bomb squad and and finds uh that the bomb is fake and it was a fake threat um, yeah, because this is because this is a silly episode. Um, finds that the bomb is fake. Fake threat. Um, operation by opposing business. Um, the doctor manages to like make the fact make the people behind it. Uh, expose them so that they get uh, arrested. Essentially, can be the the, the conclusion there. Yeah, just the, yeah, yeah. Just this is a very simple episode, just to enjoy the... our doctor and our companion. Yeah. Welcome to Earth. Here's a bomb threat. <laughs> uh, but you know, there well, has to be I'll, conflict. I'll there has to be conflict, and our season has been characterized. Uh, our our iteration Doctor Who has been characterized by a dark sense of humor. This isn't even that dark, though. It's a phony bomb threat. Like that's yeah, that's like you know, Bob's Burgers level of dark. Yeah. Have you ever seen oh, Bob's like, Burgers? Uh, no, I, I haven't. It's been on my list. I've been meaning to watch it, but it, I was I was I, about to, I was about to say it's more along the lines of that Faulty Towers episode where the guest dies. I don't remember that episode. I. I've watched a lot of Forty Towers, but not much recently. Uh, like a lot when I was much younger. That's not, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Same. That's the episode that sticks out to me. That like a guest dies and Basil has to hide it. I like that. Yeah, it's easily the darkest one. So, see, episode three. The only thing we know about it is it's set on Iowa. Hmm. Uh. Oh, so let's do the, the hospital episode then, I guess. Okay. Um, uh, given we were given we were talking about um, how our companion doesn't understand Earth customs, mm -hmm. I ha I kind of have an I kind of have an idea for an episode which is vaguely linked to that theme of the hospital. No, oh, not no, the hospital. Right, yeah. Not the hospital one, but it's vaguely linked to the idea of you know the companion comes from an alien civilization and is. Un unfamiliar with Earth customs. I've got a, I've got an idea which is sort of relevant to that. Sure. That's like a late that's like a late season one. Go for it. Um, okay. Um, do you know the uh, as as with Tomorrow's World, I uh, I have kind of made it clear that I have this obsession with old TV shows. Um, do you know the show Watch with Mother? I don't. Um, yeah, it's a ninety. It's a it's a nineteen fifties um, children's show where it's like where it's got like people with very bbc upper class accents like hello timothy and judy today we're going to learn how to make paper lanterns with pva glue okay so my idea is already. um my idea is um the doctor and lawn arrive on an alien planet where all of the it's um it's a former human colony and all the humans are dead so uh, an alien AI has tried to recreate human society, but the only thing that it has seen, the only thing that it knows knows what to do, but the only thing it knows how to recreate is all it's got is a few old episodes of 1950s children's television. So it's got this human society where everyone talks like Watch With Mother. Wait, so hang on, why is everyone dead though? Uh, I haven't thought that far. Uh, I haven't thought that far ahead. Th that far ahead yet. But I just, I had this. I had this idea of the Doctor and the companion turning up in an alien civilization where, where um, it's it's where human, where it's sort of like humans have been recreated out of an old television show. Uh, I do like that. I I, do, I really do like that. Um, as a premise, I prefer. I kind of prefer the idea of it being robots instead of humans who all talk like that. Like a bunch of yeah, robots. Yeah, robots, yeah, robots. Have trained as, as themselves. I said, as I said, this idea this is this idea is half formed and as said I'm as I said I am kind of obsessed with old television shows. Like so. I like the premise, I'm just not sure what to do with it. Hmm. Okay, come back come back to this go on to go on to the hospital story. Right. So um 
go to go get checked up on by Lorm. By the way, down the line, I'm kind of tempted to make um, Lorm a twist time lord. Okay. Because um, there's no reason oh. that she can't be. Hang on, I just hang on. I just need to go away for a second. Um, uh, All right, I'll entertain chat the chat. Chat, away. what's going on? Oh, how are you enjoying the season so far, chat? This is a lot lighter and fluffier than our last one, but I feel that's pretty much required after the last one that we had. Jurassic Park of the humans is what I'm seeing. What if they look like humans, but it turns out they're robots underneath? That certainly works. The Rani invaded Slough. Hello, Jay. Hope you're well. I am. Thank you. I asked them how they were enjoying the series. Sorry about that, I'm back. I asked them how they were enjoying the series so far, and the first thing I saw was worse than series 12. What? Uh, I asked them if they were enjoying the series so far, and the first thing I saw in chat was worse than series 12. <laughs> Liars. Sorry, hello. Um, so yeah, I... I... I'm tempted to make uh, Lorm eventually turn out to be a twist Time Lord. Um, okay. To really cement that connection between the two of them, because it would re mean that um, Lorm has to have a regeneration at some point, and the Doctor can help her through her first regeneration. Okay. And then, you Wait, know... So... Hmm. Them sharing that, I feel, would give them sort of an immovable bond after... that's quite that's quite nice so so are the um so would that make it so the um alien slave colony the slave colony that she's um in at the start of the season the guy the guy that he's the guy that she's with is who dies as a time lord as well i think that uh that they're kidnapped time lords the premise would be that she was sent as a uh, she was sent by gallifrey as a hidden Time Lord on Earth, or not on Earth, on uh, on wherever you know wherever they could hide a humanoid, um, so they they hid her where the where humans were slaves, uh, and she was hidden during the time of the Time War, so that even if the Time Lords lost, um, there would be a sort of a backup Time Lord somewhere that they could uh, that they could recover. Okay, that's quite nice. Yeah, because I do remember there was um there was a rumor that some um, Martha was going to turn out to be a Time Lord. Do you remember that one? I do not remember that one. Yeah, yeah, there was a rumor that it was going to turn out that Martha was a Time Lord and she had a pocket watch. I mean, that is so, that would be sort of the twist to go for with the pocket watch. Then I don't want to do it via pocket watch though, because pocket watch sort of overwrites the existing personality. I don't want to overwrite her personality. I, you know, that would be horrible. Uh, yeah. After, that, after they built up that connection. I want it to just be that she doesn't know that that's what she is internally. She just sees herself as a human because she is on the exterior a human and she's always thought that she was a human. Quite nice. But, you know, she was a, a Time Lord hidden by Gallifrey and as sort of a genetic backup that was hidden away. Um, I don't know, the, the main issue I take with doing that is the coincidence factor of, oh, the Doctor just happened to pick up the one person who was a hidden Time Lord. I don't know if we can justify that in any way. If we can make that less contrived. We could just write some bollocks about the TARDIS taking the Doctor where he needs to go. Yeah, mate. I, maybe, I maybe the bollocks, maybe the TARDIS, is... maybe the TARDIS could sense that the Doctor was emotionally wounded. I I know that that is I know that I call that it is... bollocks, but it is pre-established that the TARDIS deliberately takes the Doctor to places he needs to go. Well, yeah, because the TARDIS is alive. We yeah have established that. So if we, so long as we establish that before, um, it's important to the story. So long as we don't go, um, Lorm is a Time Lord. Oh, by the way, the TARDIS 
takes you where you want to go and that's why it's not contrived. But, you know, as long as we establish it before so that the audience knows it's not contrived. So that when uh, we find out that Lorm is a Time Lord and the Doctor goes, I guess the TARDIS took me to where I needed to go. Um, it's not... Maybe the... Maybe episode one starts with um, the tar with um, the TARDIS taking the Doctor to this planet, but he can't figure out why it's taking him here. Yeah, yeah, that's I love that. I, yeah, I really like that. That's great. Um, so we can have like a sequence with the Doctor um, talk with the Doctor. Um, but I just I just want shout, this to be like shouting at the TARDIS as if as if it's like a one sided conversation. I want him to be angry shouting. Mm. I want him to be more like disenfranchised. I guess I'll go out. Why, why have you taken me here? I don't, I don't really, I don't really want to. Um, but yes, the hospital episode is what we're doing. You know what I can put on screen as well? It's the poster of our beautiful Alan Rickman Doctor. That needs to be here. There we go. That can just be there and stick around. That was last season. We, we put him through some stuff uh. that season. We can have... Uh, this here as well. Oh, it takes up a bit. There we go. That's that's nice. Based. The doctor gets rabies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, the hospital episode. Um, the doctor has been persuaded to go to the hospital. Uh, I think the first checkup. Um, Oh yeah, right. The reason I bring up as well that she want that we want to be how to be a twist time lord is that we can just drop a couple of hints, but the, the kind of thing that you would only ever notice in retrospect. Um, for example, in, introduce an alien species that sees a spectrum of light so that they can see your internal organs and stuff, right? Uh, they they just see a different wave like a wavelength of light, and they can see internal organs and stuff like that, right? Uh, and that's something you find <laughs> out about this creature. What what? I'm just imagining like um, like uh, like in the um, Welcome to Earth episode, he walks up to someone and goes, "I just love your intestines. <laughs> it's so pretty." Yeah, like, um, imagine there's, like, an alien race that can see, you know, th like, they see x-ray vision. That's the, they have that vision, right? And that's just something that's established about them eventually. But when meeting, um, when meeting Lorm and the Doctor, they say, um, they assume they're the same species. And they go, oh, no, 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 we're not the same species. And the creature goes, oh, really? You look very much alike. Which to anyone else will just be like, well, yeah, Time Lords look like humans. But then in retrospect, when you watch that back, you'll go... Oh, you can see the insides as well, and oh, that makes sense. I want, I want there to be details like that in there. Yeah. You know, we can just have people uh, when they meet aliens have those two just going, "Oh no, 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 we're not the same species," and that's um, and that can be a recurring thing because actually, actually, they are. What? But yeah, hospital episode. We, we, we keep getting distracted from right And she goes, wait, wait, episode. you have two hearts? What a coincidence. I have two hearts as well. I mean, there's no reason that it would ever really come up. Um, okay, so... How about in the hospital episode... Uh, do, oh, this is me thinking about coronavirus again. Just thinking that there's some sort of... Pandemic going on? Pande sort of, some sort of alien pandemic going on. Is this is, is this hospital on um, Iowa? I was thinking that, but I think this needs to be a civilization with more advanced medicine than what they would have on Iowa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there could be a couple of Mildreds there, you know, just about. Because, but I guess this would be in the future for them. But when they've started exploring alien planets, yeah. But what we would have is um, is we would have um, the doctor goes there, has to get a checkup, um, gets explains what happened, uh, tells the doctors, "Oh, I'm a time lord from the planet Gallifrey." Um, oh yeah, we've, we've 
we've had a couple of Time Lords in here before. We'll see what you can do. They don't see any evidence of an infection, but by the end of the episode, um, the Doctor has to have essentially the light exercised from him. I guess we can call the episode... No, the giving, calling it the light gives it away, doesn't it? But I, I really do like the idea that there's just... Again, we have an episode of just a sinister building feeling where none of them can find the light in him, but you sort of know it's there or the episode wouldn't be taking place. Maybe the light starts in. Maybe the light starts infecting other pe patients in the hospital. And I like maybe, that, but I don't want to put on. the doctor through the guilt train again, where he'd blame hang himself on, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm just thinking maybe the light infects other people in the hospital, but it doesn't really do much to the doctor because he's immune to it because he's a time lord. But it isn't infecting his companion. So that, that sort of implies so that sort of implies really that they cool. are the same species. That's really cool, but I don't want to put the doctor through the. I want the doctor to go somewhere and be essentially directly responsible for people's deaths when his arc is recovering from that thing. Well, maybe they don't die as such. I guess you know if the hospital has good enough resources to just sedate people when it happens. And then the doctor can be like, "Oh, that's the light." Uh, he and he can be taken to isolation, and they can uh, exercise him from there. I don't know. I feel like I'm not sure if it needs to infect other people earlier on, or if he just. We well, gotta have some sort of conflict in there. Yeah. Well, I f I feel like the creature should be playing its moment to reveal itself. So when he's getting checked up, um, it's not there. It's hiding. But then. Um, he actually... Okay, so how does this work? So... Oh, let's, say, like, let's, let's say it can only hide for a, a limited amount of time. Right, so it's trying to hide while it's getting the checkup. You know it's there. There's a sinister building feeling that the light is in his eye throughout this whole episode. Um, and then at the end, it's sort of... Or, not, or nearer the end, in, like the, in the rising action... It, it uh it breaks free and starts uh making the doctor really violent and aggressive and and attacking people right and the conflict of the episode this can be a, an episode where lorm has to act without the help of the doctor for the first time because the doctor is is being possessed essentially uh and because he's possessed lorm has to act on her own and she's been essentially apprenticed to the Doctor for this whole season. Uh, and this is her chance to prove herself without him there. To guide yeah. her. Um, and she has to stop the light. Yeah, and she has to help stop the light. They help exercise him, essentially essentially an exorcism. They have the technology to do that in, the, in this hospital, but they just have to uh, capture him and, and get him sedate it and, and fix it and you can still have the ending where the medical staff say this should have fixed it but we don't know what it was we have no idea what that was it was really weird because i do want to preserve the mystery of this thing and i never want to come back to it either i want it to just be a, forever a mystery um what do we call this episode hospital of light i like it uh I'm not entirely sold on it though. Like it's, it's it's okay. The monster should be a multi-limbed creature made out of embryos from the hospital's furnace. Uh, the light is in the doctor's eye. He has to get it fixed with medicine. And obviously the, the conclusion to this episode is um, the doctor does go and cause some harm, like when he's in that form, but Lorm says, it's okay, I know that wasn't you. And that's really important because it contrasts the previous season. Yeah. Um, 
where the, the yeah it, 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 where the the companion completely loses trust in the doctor at the end of the previous season in this season the doctor goes off the rails but the the companion understands what went wrong that it wasn't actually him and that he's okay knows him well enough to know that he wouldn't deliberately hurt people and that everyone makes mistakes all right um hang on let me let me refill my glass of water violate tos um okay uh what are the terms of service for people uh blah, blah, blah. H hang on i'm just opening the terms of service so that i can violate them because you know i've got i'm in charge of jay's channel briefly i'm in charge in terms of service Anyway, I command you, people in the chat, to write boobs with eights instead of Bs. Actually, uh, uh, okay, while Jay's away, um, I'm not start away, I'm writing. Back. Oh, yeah. What were you gonna you do? Am you and living in a small space? I was gonna get the. I was gonna get people in the chat to start writing completely confusing shit and make out like we've been having a really deep and intellectual conversation. You're gonna get people away. in the chat to make out. Yes, that was it. The lights of us. Is that a Last of Us thing? <laughs> the haunting of Hospital Diodati. Um Right, okay, so Um There's always one episode that we can't name for shit. We can come back to it, can't we? Um, oh, dancing with lights. <laughs> I like it as a reference to the, the line from the TV movie. But it also sounds like some NAF ITV thing. Uh, right. Um, someone's just said lights out. Nah, I don't, I don't want to make... I don't, I don't, I don't want to make... Uh, people always suggest puns. Like, that's the... That's the the, the, uh, the the theme I notice when you ask people for episode title suggestions. It's always just... Remember last time when we were trying to name our finale? And every... The light, in, the light inside of us. Oh, yeah, every everyone was like... Um... A star in his eye. The passenger. I like calling it the passenger because, okay, let me explain my rationale here. It's vague. The creature is a passenger hitching like a lift in the doctor. Um, and the vagueness of it doesn't give away that there actually was the creature in his eye. It's like, I, 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 just, I, I like the idea of this having a vague title. Any objections? Uh, no, no objections. Right, that's, that could be... If we think of a better one, we can go back to it and change it. But uh, one thing I've noticed is we are very free of two-part stories this uh, this season. Normally there's an yeah. early two-parter, but we've not done one. We don't have to have them all the time. No, I, I agree. Maybe 9, 10 would be a two-parter. 11 will be a, a standalone and then a finale. So... Um, I'm not sure. Um, I want to get the alien in there, which was the premise that they go to Iowa and they... True. Uh, we only have someone, one two-part of this season. Someone sees them and goes, oh, I know exactly why you're here. Then we could absolutely just have one. Or, or the finale can be a, a two-parter as well. Although I don't feel it needs to be that big of a finale. It's, you know, it's a, a small, understated, character-driven finale, which hopefully people yeah. will appreciate. Yeah. I feel we're missing a. I, I feel we're missing a historical type piece. Sure. Um, I don't want to try. I don't. I don't, I don't feel. I don't feel we should be driven by the need to fit everything that a traditional yeah, yeah, Doctor yeah. season has in the, because we are trying to include like three stories in a new setting and and stuff like that. Right. So if we have. Um, 
if we make episode nine the alien, so that's the episode where they go to. Um, okay, what if episode nine and ten are also a two-parter? Yeah, okay, I'm cool with that. Um, and they are... Because there are two things that I kind of want to do on EOL. Let, let's do them both, right? Let's combine the alien with the story where we look at the alien ruins in more detail on um, on EOL. Because we know that there are... We've already established that there are crashed alien ships on EOL that have been there for, uh, you know, as long as their prehistory, essentially. Yeah, I mostly just I mostly just said that thing about the um, historical thing because we've got quite a Lovecraftian thing going on here, with um with beneath the ice. Yeah. So I was just sort of thinking of I was just sort of trying to think of an episode of Doctor Who where Doc the Doctor meets Lovecraft, but that does invite its problems. It does, yeah. Yeah. Get through this episode without saying the N word. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, I don't know, I feel like that's, um, that would <laughs> be quite a difficult one to do. I feel like that as well, the, it's, it's quite a similar, at least just on, on paper as a very, you know, it's, it's superficially similar to something we did pre in the previous season. Yeah, yeah. Um. I mostly, I mostly just, that, that came to me because I like historical episodes and we have kind of a Lovecraftian thing going on with this. Yeah, yeah. Unknown monster. Um, okay, so the alien um, landing on Iowa, uh, the Doctor and Lorm are greeted with uh, by a Mildred who immediately assumes the purpose of their vid visit and takes them to what they assume the purpose is. Okay, actually, mm, there's a, I'm encountering a problem. Uh, and that problem is, if um, they've been to Iowa already, why haven't they been told about this guy before? Because they would, because, you know, an alien living on Iowa, or, you know, a human, but to them an alien living on Iowa, um, and then some other two other people who look like that same, you know, look this, look to be the same race appear. Um, maybe this isn't Iowa. Maybe it isn't, but then we do want, we do, then where do we fit our Iowa stories? Uh, hmm. Because we haven't done episode three yet, and that's about... Isn't that supposed to be an EO one? That's supposed to be the the the, the EO introduction. Yeah. If we um. Okay, so long as we just pay lip service to this episode in the first EO episode, I feel like we can do it. Um. If when they're seen on EO, they um. It's just mentioned in a throwaway line or like in passing by um, a Mildred there that's a local um, says, oh, you should. Oh, you guys are uh, of that species. You should go down to this town, whatever, um, because we've uh, there's, you know, there's because um, that person is over there. Right. And that's they're like, oh, cool. Thanks to, for letting us know. We're sort of doing whatever we're doing at the moment now. But sure. Thanks for the tip. You know, essentially a throwaway line that says. We haven't forgotten in the first Iowa is, episode. Maybe this is maybe this is Iowa like centuries in the past. No, I don't think so. Cause actually, maybe mm. that kind of, that does work. Yeah, I mean that kind of works. That, that, how... that does have to be sort of expositioned away, though. Hmm. Um. I do prefer just if we pay lip service to it in our first Iowa story, then I I think it's fine. It doesn't have to be, you know, this big thing. It's like, um, it, you know, they're, they're met um, and they go, oh, you're, uh, I think we've, we've got another one of your lot living down, uh, down, down in this city. Uh, you should go and just go and see them sometime. 
They're quite curious to know about their own people. Uh, and then, you know, that's the throwaway line, and then you've got it. And that's it. I feel like that's fine. As long as we acknowledge it. Yeah, I think that's fine. All right, then we can do it. The alien. Landing on Eo, the Doctor and Lorma greeted by a Mildred, who immediately assumes the purpose of their visit and takes them to meet... Um, uh, take, takes them to a, a place of residence. They knock on the door or the alien equivalent and uh, the door is opened by a uh, human person who immediately has an incredibly, like, an emotional breakdown, bursts into tears, uh, or, you know, may, perhaps not, not not that, not to that degree, perhaps not tears, but, you know, and it, it, it's a very emotional reaction to seeing the Doctor and Lorm, right? Uh, and that is because they have never seen another human being before and have been raised on this planet in uh, in 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 uh, the culture uh, of you know, Iowa. And this is a great way to explore. Uh, to, first of all, this is a great way to world build Iowa. It shows how they interact with alien people more. Uh, it shows how an alien to that culture lives in that culture. But um, so yeah, it's it's about it's about a human feeling isolated. Yeah. Uh, and it's essentially it's a big part of it is the character piece where you explore how this person feels having never met other humans before. Yeah. Um. Someone in the chat just puts maybe they think that they're their returning returning parents. I was gonna say, but does the age work with that? But how would they know? <laughs> they don't know what a, an aging human looks like. Yeah, because they've been isolated for so long. Yeah, I mean they've they've got friends there. They've got uh they've got friends that are Mildreds, but they've never met other humans before. This is quite similar to uh where am I? A human getting stuck on, um... Oh yeah, we are fucking... I'm dumb. We agreed that where am I would be our introduction to, uh... To Eeyore. Yeah, yeah. And um, then... Yeah, but then, then would episode 3 be our first introduction to Earth? Yes. Yeah, so that works. So then it's episode 4 that we need to fill. Yes, okay. Um, right. And we haven't done a shit episode. We need a shit episode. <laughs> no, we don't plan that. One of the episodes just will be One when it's made. So it sort of just happens to be shit. Uh, right, so... Yeah, Welcome to Earth is our episode three. So do we want episode four to be, um, oh, I've written episode three. Do you want episode four to be our, uh, what, what, I mean, we can fill that with anything we want, I guess. That's, we'll, we'll put a pin in it. Um, okay, um, okay, well, cause, um, I have always thought about doing the Doctor Meets Kafka. What's that? You know, Franz Kafka, Metamorphosis, The Trial. No, this is the problem with <laughs> this is the problem with um, me being this um, me being this um, literary nerd. Um, okay, basically, basically, one of my favorite books is *The Trial* by Franz Kafka. Um, basically, it's about this guy who um, one one day he's just placed under arrest and he's not told why. He's not told what he's supposed to have done. It's just um, there's the, it's just there's this unseen. There's this unseen legal group of lawyers who work, who operate in these attics, and they just randomly go around arresting people for no apparent reason. It's 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 a it's a bit of paranoid absurdist fiction, right? So you're and on... my hmm? my 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 idea was um, the doctor goes and visits Kafka, and Kafka has been arrested by this group of aliens that are that have arrived on Earth and are 
and have adopted the the persona of this legal division, which are um, going around and arresting humans. So, I was going to say to start to study to study to, to study how humans react when put on when I put like, in strange and inexplicable. I do like this. This is really fun. I was going to say that I, I I was cautious of doing this a, a premise uh, another like um you know uh, historical uh, writer premise. Uh, or uh, you know uh, any uh, going back and, and doing another. Well, I mean, I'm a literary nerd, so yeah. I but come up then with... I thought, fuck it, let's characterize the Alec Rickman Doctor as a literary nerd, and he goes yeah, yeah. and he, he he loves and he loves seeking these people out, and that's you know he goes and meets writers, and that's something he does. I like that as a thing about his character as well, and I I love this premise. This is really fun. Yeah, I mean, I like that mostly because, um, mostly because uh, the guy is put under, um, the guy is arrested and he's not told why. And the book has lots of things about paranoia, social alienation, and feeling judged by people, but not really knowing why. Oh, this... And I think this, I think this kind of works with what we've done to our doctor because our doctor is feeling guilty over what happened to um, Jody last season. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do really like this. Um, what do you want to call it? The overseers. That's what this. De- that's what this legal department is. Um, they're see- they're watching over humanity and judging them, and seeing how they react when put under inexplicable amount in- uh, inexplicable stress. Right. Oh, yeah, I do. I do really like this. Um, our doctor is a, a literary nerd. Um, I feel like I could imagine that um, in like the the tenth season that we write, you write a premise where the Doctor meets you and you're surrounded by meta jokes, uh, <laughs> and, and every like because like you know, um, it's like yeah, it's a very Doctor Who thing to go and meet a, a writer. Um, and then they're surrounded by the actual thing they wrote about. You know, we've got Unquiet Dead, uh, Silver Turk. Uh, those are the only two examples that spring to mind, but well, I'm sure it's been well, done more. It, well, because that's the thing. You write from experience, don't you? Yeah. Although, I, you know, not entirely literally, but yeah. Not entirely literally, but, you know, inspired by experiences. We do have mostly original creatures this season as well. I've just realised that. It's, we're... we're... Well, that's what... That was one of the that was one of the things that I suggested because you know last season is last season had a lot of yeah lot, yeah a lot of returning villains. I think it's I think it's good to have like loads of original stuff. I, I do like that we're doing that. Like I, it wasn't at the front of my mind, but I'm like, oh, we have managed to do that anyway. Like I wasn't I wasn't um, like prioritizing it very highly. I was thinking, oh, if I think of a cool story with loads of recur- returning stuff, I'm not just going to exclude it for that. But I guess I just haven't. <laughs> Well, no, I guess Beneath the Ice is full of is full of stuff that's pre-established, but it's not about stuff that's pre-established, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's got it, stuff that's pre-established in it. It uses the stuff that the audience may know about already as a jumping off point to do new things. It's yeah, not, it's and not another, about the And another stuff. reason I quite like this um, Overseer's idea is that it's, fil- it's full of inexplicable bureaucracy, and that's kind of, that's kind of similar to Where Am I, in that it's got and it's got an airport where you're not allowed out. Planet of the Bureaucrats. Planet of the Bureaucrats, yeah. Actually, that's a, I, I kind of like that as an episode title. Should we have that for the Kafka-themed episode, then? Planet of the Bureaucrats? Yeah, uh, Unless we the actually go to their we... planet, though. Oh, yeah, we don't go to their planet, yeah. Yeah, yeah I call it the Overseers, yeah. Uh, right, okay, we've got... So we're doing the alien... And I, I, I kind of want this to be our two-part story. I'm not sure, though. Because I really like the idea of um, of the Doctor exploring the alien ruins that are on Eowa. The crashed spaceships that are there and have been there for millennia. Uh, yeah, I like that as well. With the Doctor's uh, additional knowledge, he could, you know, discover something about these ships that they haven't been able to for thousands of years simply by virtue of him having... Uh, outside knowledge that they don't have access to. 
like for example he might recognize the design of uh of the ship and say oh these ships always or well will normally fly in formation so if you go to this point in your ocean you might find another one because that's where it would be relative to this one or something along those lines Um, but it, there needs uh, there needs to be a threat and conflict. It can't just be you know. I guess. Um... Oh, that could be cool. Okay, so the doctor knows. Um, the doctor recognizes like a feature of the architecture in the ship, and uh, tells them, "Oh, there's going to be a whole extra load of rooms underneath that you haven't explored because you don't know they were there." Uh, and he manages to no, that, that's good, yeah. To remove the panel, and so it's essentially the, doc the doctors involved. The doctors involved with this alien society undergoing archaeology for their own yeah. And it, but it's dangerous archaeology where the the ship's defenses are still active after all these thousands of years, and they oh. they're essentially he's helping them survive the ship's defenses. Oh, I've just had an idea. What if okay? What if they dis what if they discover like alien hieroglyphics? In the, in the, in this um in this temple, which appear to tell the story of this alien civilization, and it gets up to the point where this alien civilization gets destroyed, but then it keeps going, and then it shows the it sh it shows the rise of the new civilization of Eowa, and it keeps going. It tells their story and it predicts a catastrophe that's about to strike the planet. I like it, but I'm not sure how we work it in. Like, would the would the catastrophe be our finale then? I like. Actually, yeah, I do like for, that. Sort of like foreshadowing the finale. Yeah. Um, I do like that. I'm not sure. So, we, so we still don't so, really so know what. So it's this. Lo so it's this lost alien civilization that can predict the future. We still don't really know what the events of our finale are going to be. Yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's why I'm just sort of spitballing this idea in there. I do like that. I I, I do want to like. I do want to keep that at like the top of the ideas list for now. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, so this is episode 10, yeah? Yeah, but we do need Doctor, to... Do Doctor Alien Archaeology. Yeah, so the alien is episode 9. Um, and then this would be, I guess, a two-part. Do you think we can... Yeah, I guess... I, I think, this I think we've got enough to work with here because the alien uh, is, would, uh, would, uh, is essentially a character-driven story on its own. And then this is the the alien, the, the human who's been living on Eowa all this time, uh, goes with the Doctor to do the archaeology. Yeah, I like that we got this little run of episodes where the Doctor just sort of stays hanging about on Eowa. Yeah, I, I like I like that. It's fun. Um, I like the idea that um, maybe Lorm likes Eowa and asks to go back. Yeah, that makes sense. And okay, that could be part of the Doctor's arc as well, because Lorm is asking to go back to Iwa, and the Doctor kind of likes the idea that she'll find a home there and move out of the TARDIS, because he doesn't really yeah. want. He doesn't. He like as much as he likes having her around. He doesn't like having a companion because he doesn't trust himself anymore. Yeah, and the arc can essentially be him deciding no, actually, as much as he would be happy for her if she did find a home there. That's not something that he actively wants to try and make happen oh that was a yeah. lovely voice crack i'm proud of myself uh you know he's not going to try and push her away he's he's happy for her to be around and that's the, that's the, the the arc yes um i like that i like that uh, the karen apocalypse <laughs> push lorm away uh, one thing that could be climactic for a finale is if, uh, since we've got Ice Warriors in the uh, in the episode, and we know uh, we established with them that there was a civilization on Mars that got destroyed, we could go and do a, a the Death of Mars finale because it's been yeah, built up, and we do um, 
Yeah, I, I like that as an idea as well. That's another thing that I want to put a pin in. Yeah, put a pin in that. I do. Oh yeah. What? Since since we since we just mentioned the Doctor going back and meeting meeting um historical figures, I just thought I'd like an episode where the Doctor shows up on the set of the room. <laughs> not literary, not literary focused, maybe, but that's just something I would like to see. That I I would love for Tommy Wiseau to have a cameo in Doctor Who as himself. <laughs> Oh yeah, that'd be great. Um, um, beneath, oh yeah, we need a title for episode six and seven. I guess we can just call them part one and part two. Uh, the alien slash the ruins. Right. So um, yeah, six four, seven four. called the six the frozen wasteland seven beneath the ice. Uh, yeah, sure. Go with that. That sounds sci-fi-y. The Frozen Wastes. Uh, right. I do love that it's an Ice Warrior story with Frozen and Ice in the episode titles purely by coincidence. <laughs> we didn't plan that. We didn't We didn't mean to do that. No, honest, we didn't. No, we didn't I didn't. I that. named it. I swear. Rise of the Karens, Age of the Anti-Vaxxers. <laughs> uh, okay. So yeah, the, the Alien and the Ruins, I feel, aren't... It's not a longer story that justifies being a two-parter, but I think it's a story we want to flesh out more and then make it two parts. It's a, because, it's a, story, it's a s story that's sort of vaguely interlinked. Essentially, the Doctor and, e and Lom arrive on Iwa... Um, in this can be the first time they go to the capital, I guess. Yeah. And they get they get going. Oh, you guys are aliens. Can you um you, you guys want to meet the other alien? Okay. Now we've got this alien ship that crashed here ages ago. Do you want to come see it? Because you might have some insight. And that's that's how the the plot works. That's why they're doing these things now. Maybe the maybe um maybe the the authorities on Iowa are encouraging to are encouraging this sort of thing to drum up tourism. What do you mean? Maybe the authorities on Iowa are inviting the doctor, are inviting the doctor and this alien to the ruins because they want, because they want tourism. They want the money, for infrastructure. Yeah, I guess. I mean, we, you already do know why they're going back there, though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. No, I was just thinking. I was just thinking that. But maybe we'd like to. Maybe we'd like to flesh out the authorities on Iowa. I do like the idea of it being the authorities find them this time, and that's why they get taken to go see the. Um, they get they get they get asked to go and see the other human who lives there, and they get asked to go and see the ruins. Um, and yeah, yeah, I'm so mostly bringing I'm, I'm bringing in the authorities as well because we sort of have this. Hmm? We sort of, we we sort of have this bureaucratic societal fixtures theme running throughout this like i've got like i've got episode four here with like the legal system I episode eight we're episode eight set in a hospital i don't want to give um i don't want to make i, I do want to make uh your um not not i don't want it to be t to come off particularly authoritarian or anything like that i do want it to seem no but that does as, need to be like uh, yeah. infrastructure it needs to be like sort yeah. of similar to earth but not i i feel like it should be more of like a by the people for the people kind of a, a bureaucracy they've got going on. A, a, at the very least, a chill bureaucracy. Uh, you know, yeah, these aren't these aren't people. Chill bureaucracy. Yeah, these chill. aren't people that arrive with guns and go. You must help us with our archaeology. These are people that go you, um, with the hey, authorities. Do you want to help us with, your... with the hey, authorities. We would appreciate it greatly and yeah. have. Uh, we'd appreciate it greatly, greatly, and would be willing to pay you to do this. And Zork goes, "Oh, I don't want any money, but I'll oh, sure I'll help you out. You seem you seem nice." Um. So, uh, yeah. So in this story, we do have we want to flesh out the character of the the uh, the human who lives there a lot, uh, and flesh out the society, and just you know examine his character, and that's a huge part of the story. And through examining his character, you examine the Doctor and Lorm further. And on the other, and while all that's going on, you have uh, 
the archaeological thing where they're trying to get inside the ship uh, further and the ship's defenses are still working after thousands of years. And that's the danger. That's the that's the conflict. Yes. I like the I like the idea that this ancient spaceship is the villain, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh sort of like um the opening episode of Blake Seven, which I haven't seen for donkey's years, but I'm being reminded of. There's also a plot line like this in Stellaris, which is really fun, on the Enigmatic Fortress. Has anyone in chat know what I'm talking about? Has anyone in chat done the Enigmatic Fortress in Stellaris? Chat is not moving very quickly. Chat, are you are you okay? I see the words, a chill bureaucracy in the same way no BS is a chill lol cow. <laughs> Uh, right. Right, okay, let's, uh... Right, we, how many episodes have we got to fill left? We've got... We've got everything from episodes, uh, we've got, yeah, we've got episodes one through nine. Oh no, we've got episodes one through ten. We've got, oh, okay. Yeah, we just got the last three. And I know what I want to do for the one be right before the finale. Okay, go for it. Adric. Okay, go, okay, do your Adric idea. So, um, this is the Doctor opening up, and the arc the Doctor has been going over has been the Doctor opening up and learning to trust again, and not blame himself for people who die. Right? Right. Uh, episode 11 sees the Doctor receive a... Um, right, first of all. Episode 11. Uh, in the world of the dead. Right. Uh, the Doctor receives an invitation. This is... Okay, first of all, we want to introduce the... Uh, the doctor's uh, the tardis's translation matrix in this episode we want to re we want to establish that this really quickly uh right we want um and we want to establish as well that it's capable of mistranslations when a concept is uh going between cultures and might be translated differently between those two cultures right yeah so we want um for example um the doctor says something to lorm and Lorne repeats it back, and it's a different sentence. And the Doctor's going, um, that's a different sentence. And she says, N no, it's not. And he goes, oh, that must be a discrepancy in the translator. Uh, that I distinguish between those two things and you don't, or something like that, you know? That, um, But the beginning of the episode sees the Doctor receive a, uh, a psychic invitation through the TARDIS which takes the form of... This can even be where the translation discrepancy comes in. It can be um, this piece of literature is translated differently for the Doctor and Lorne. Um, but it's an invitation to a haunted house. The Doctor thinks, could be fun, and goes to the haunted house, which is a, a, like a, a cool uh, structure of, you know, alien design. Or actually, no, it's... Um, you enter it psychically, so it's a... You put a thing on your head and it takes you there mentally and you go. Right? And um, I sh I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure on that detail. I okay, I shall know. Yeah, you don't enter it psychically. I'm, I'm talking up my ass. Um, you, the doctor thinks he's going there physically, but isn't really. Um, or it's ambiguous whether he went there physically or not. He goes to the haunted house and he meets... Uh, and it's, it's a spooky environment. This is alien architecture where... Uh, Stuff doesn't quite seem right. Uh, and he's expecting other guests. There's this huge, like, table with places lined out. And each seat is empty except his and Lorm's. And they, they sit down. Uh, and Lorm's. I called her Lorm. Uh, they sit down at their places. And they await the other guests. And they're like, oh, I guess they're late. And they go and explore the house. Uh, in the house, the Doctor eventually hears... Doctor? 
and he turns around and he sees not at all the aged and not in his original like costume at all but maybe with the broken badge that he the the, the star badge that he used to have and he broke in uh, Earthshock Adric is there and he goes oh my god Adric how are you here what you you're and you know um so people in chat who aren't classic coup fans this episode will establish who Adric is for you you don't need to worry that you don't know who Adric is because the episode will establish that Adric was a former companion of the doctor who died and the doctor couldn't save so this is basically the view from halfway down but with doctor who it is a lot like that yes yes <laughs> I'm on board with that. Um, and we do start introducing other dead characters from the show. Like, uh, oh, what's her last name? Sarah something from Dalek's Sarah King- Master Plan. Sarah yeah, Kingdom Sarah from Kingdom. Dalek Master Plan. Sarah Kingdom from Dalek's Master Plan. I have a list of people I want to include. It doesn't. They don't actually have to be dead because of the final premise is that this is all happening uh, similar to the psychic pollen in Amy's Choice. This is something that's being induced in the Doctor mentally. It isn't a physical event. These people aren't actually here this is the Doctor talking with his perceptions of these people all these years later and essentially confronting the never was, the, um, the, the, the people who never got to grow old, but now they are old and he's seeing what they missed out on. So this is good for his arc because this, this is good for his arc this season because he's, been, because he's confronting his failures. Yeah. So Sahara Kingdom is there. You can have Harriet Jones there as well who died to uh, essentially summon him. And if he was there anyway, he, she wouldn't have had to do that. Uh, you can have I Bill like Potts there. I like there. the idea of bringing back Harriet Jones. Bill, have Bill Potts there as well. Lucy Miller. Uh, yeah, Lucy Miller. Lucy Miller would absolutely belong there. Spoilers. Because um, this season has been quite short on... Um, has been quite short on old enemies and mm. bringing back old stuff. Missy. Oh yeah, Missy. That's a good shout as well. Um, but this whole time, the guests are arriving one by one, and the whole time there's this empty seat at the head of the table. You know who sits there. Everyone knows who sits there, even though it's never said. Lorm even know Lorm. Why do I keep calling a Lorm? Lorn even knows who's there. And um, actually, can I make a, a quick adjustment to how we spell Lorn? Okay, go on. Lawn, like L A U N. I prefer that. It feels more like a name. Yeah. Uh, all right. And I guess that would just be a meta thing because there's no reason for her to have a canon spelling of her name with uh, English characters. But uh, okay, so yeah, we have uh, these characters are introduced one by one. And because the, doc- the Doctor doesn't know this, but they're not ghosts in any way, they're not- of course he doubts that they would really be ghosts, but these are just his perceptions of uh, the futures that never were. And maybe, and... These, percep- maybe these perceptions gain, s- gain sentience. Well, yeah, the, the only thing that the, the system that's showing them to him can draw from is his own perceptions. So they all start blaming him for their deaths. Yes. Um, and, you know... The head of the decide, table. They all decide, they all decide to try and murder him. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, totally. The head of the table is um, Jody Queen, of course, and she doesn't arrive until oh. the end. And she's the most scolding. She is the most, you know. Uh, I like the idea that I like the idea of them, them being this sort of intimidating horde. Yeah, yeah, I, I love the idea. Like they, they all. Sp- they, like at the climax of the episode, they can all be speaking in unison. Yeah, it sort of reminded me of. Ha, have you ever seen Darren Aronofsky's Mother? That sounds like it's you're just referring to a person. <laughs> you, you, no, you. Have yeah, you ever seen Darren's mum? No, ma, no uh, Darren Aronofsky made this film called Mother. Um, I've not. It's this. It's this allegorical psychological horror film about um about this um this husband and wife uh the the uh, wife has got pregnant and the husband just keeps on inviting people into the house for no reason and the people the, and the people get like have have like this rabid hero worship of the husband and they want to see the baby and it get- I, I okay I won't spoil it actually but it's just it, it's really really strange and so and so it follows this weird dream logic and 
the people that keep on getting invited into the house are like this intimidating horde of people, and that's why I'm imagining this to seem like. Yeah, yeah. Is this? I recommend watching Mother. It's really fucking weird. Oh yeah, I, I, that sounds good. Uh, it it's sounds on Netflix. Up, it sounds up my alley. I nearly set up my ass then. That. <laughs> <laughs> it's also that. Um. So yeah, the um. The horde essentially starts blaming the doctor for for all of them dying. Um, the person who manages to snap him out of it is the only real person there other than him, who's Lorne. Who, uh... Who... Matt, who actually is able to talk to him and say, you know, you've known a lot of people. There's no way you could avoid all of this. You've lived for such a long time. And after that, um, before all of the... Before they leave, the Doctor is able to have just, like, a nice one-on-one -on -one talk with Adric... Um, as if they were, as if he was sort of back from the dead just for a brief time and essentially say, man, you know, it's been a while. And I'm really sorry that I, that, that I haven't been able to, uh, talk to you more and that you're gone. Um, and Adric say, it's okay. You know, we all go sometimes and though it was tragic, what happened to me, I don't blame you for it. And that, and that's the ending of the episode before we go into the finale. Actually, that could kind of work as the finale, I guess, but because it, it does sort of feel quite like tying a bow on the Doctor's arc. Hmm. But I, I'm not sure I want to actually make it the finale or not. It would work. It would be cool as two parts, I think. Hmm. I have to. I, I know. That, I keep... has, that's the th that's the thing. I quite like that as. A, I quite like that as an understated cerebral character study type episode kind of like heaven sent yeah exactly hey guys yeah, guys we're we're sort of thing you're imagine for. heaven sent just imagine that isn't our episode great yeah it's amazing isn't it all right i'm, I'm gonna go pee uh, you know that's probably a result of drinking water all stream but it's what i'm gonna go do okay i'll um i'll, I'll entertain chat chats what, what do you want me to talk about Someone, 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 someone suggests something, and I will talk about that while Jay's way peeing. I think that series twelve would have been better if Jodie had a bow in her hair. Yeah, I agree with that. The costume is everything, isn't it? Maybe, maybe, maybe Doctor Who would be good again if the Doctor wore a hat. Like a really, really big hat. I remember years and years ago, um, the TV was on, and I was watching the royal wedding. I can't remember which royal wedding it was. Who knows? And I was just sort of hypnotized because there were people in these really massive hats, like flying saucers, like flying around the screen. Write a Doctor Who spin-off. Um, oh, write a Doctor Who spin-off. That's actually, that's actually a good suggestion because I have this idea for a Doctor Who spin-off. Um... Maybe a bit. Maybe it would be a big finish spinoff. Who knows? Big finish. If you're listening, hi me. Um, yeah, I have an idea for a Doctor Who spinoff um, called Saxons People, and it's um, set in. It, it's um, about. It's about the. Um, it's set during Saxons' campaign during the year that year of Sound of Drums, where that's where Saxons like convincing people to vote for him, but they're not quite sure why. There's like all these broadcasts going on in the background. And like people are talking about Saxon in the pub, like, so what do you what do you think about this Saxon bloke? Oh yeah, he's got good policies. What are his policies? Um, don't know. Yeah, because I just I I really like that line in sound of in sound of drums, it, like that scene in sound of drums where um the tenth Doctor is going to Martha and Jack. So why did you like it? What 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 do you like about Saxon? I don't know. He's just sort of good, you know. You'd trust him. What is your favorite? What is your favorite Doctor, and why is it Big Nasty? I, I don't know. Hello. A giant hat episode. <laughs> um, we've got to write an episode about a giant hat. Have we? Fuck yes. I had an idea uh, while yeah. I was peeing. Okay, the season finale is about a giant hat that's going to arrive on Iowa in a thousand years' time. I had an idea. Uh, okay, go on. What if we make? Um... The Alien and the Ruins, what it, currently episode 9 and 10, 
the finale, right? Because this is a more understated fin- um, season, we don't need a huge bombastic finale, but I feel just leaving the finale on a reveal could be a fun way to make it seem, you know, like a decent way to end point. the season. So, if we move episode 9 and 10 to the end of the series, they are the finale now. You may be thinking, that, you know, they're not some big bombastic finale episodes. They're not. They're, this is an understated finale. Um, but uh, there's a reason for this. This is... Um, okay, so... The ship's defenses, right? Uh, I mean, you know, you know, you know what the reveal is going to be already. But imagine you didn't, and this would be cool. Um, the ship's defenses target. Um, there's one defense where they have. Uh, <clears throat> well, let's say the ship was built in the Time War, which uh, we'll reintroduce to the audience as just a war that involved the Time Lords, right? This is a ship that was built during that time. Um, so, and that can be a throwaway line. It doesn't need to be, like, hammered home. The audience doesn't need to be hit over the face with that information. It's just, they're vaguely aware of it. Uh, you know, it, um, okay. But, uh, as they're trying to get inside the ship, the, uh, uh, there's a defense mechanism that really, like, messes with the heads of the Doctor and, uh, and Lorne. You know, they're, you know, sort of, like, grabbing their head and, ah, kind of a... <laughs> Uh, you, you know, you know, something that that fucks with your head, that kind of security measure, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and the reveal at the end, uh, but it doesn't affect, it doesn't affect the other human that they're with, who is the human who lives on Eowa. Um, and you're like, oh, why? Well, and they're, they're trying to figure out why. Uh, they're trying to figure out what is. They're trying to figure out what's special about the guy from Iowa that he's not affected by this uh, this this security system, right? Right. Um, but at the end of the episode, um, after they've uh, left the uh, the spaceship and escaped, um, the Doctor goes, uh, "I figured out uh, why uh, the I figured out why the." The, the security system on the spaceship wasn't hitting uh let's just call him fucking fred let's let's call him fred uh i figured out why the security system on the spaceship wasn't affecting fred and uh lawn goes why why what is it uh and he goes um it only hits time lords and that's a sweet little moment to end on of uh, yeah where he realizes that some um... Lorne is a Time Lord. Yeah, and then sort of sharing that moment of, huh, together is, is the end of our season. And that's why the TARDIS brought him to, um, brought yeah, him yeah, to Lorne yeah. in the first place. That's quite nice. We... This, is a, this is a much sweeter season. Than I feel like that's one. what we needed. Yeah, I think so, yeah. The Doctor's got, like, I want I want the doctor to have just like a close trusted friend now. Yeah. This is a much sweeter season. Like like Memories of the Daleks is a much sweeter take on a um Dalek invasion because it's already happened. Yeah. I mean, last time it was what if there was something so horrible even the Daleks were hurt by it. So we've got uh we've got two episodes worth of slots to fill here. Um my idea about um, a robot society trying to recreate humanity by imitating an episode of Watch with Mother. Uh, that's a setting, but I do like it as a setting. That's a setting. That's a vague premise. I haven't got a plot with it yet, though. Those are important. I'll, I'll write it in the notes so that if we don't use it now, we can use it um, in the next one of these we do. Maybe these robots are trying. Uh, maybe these robots have to entertain the um, the gods from Greatest Show in the Galaxy. Oh, I don't remember them. I just I've not seen Greatest Show in the Galaxy. That's why I don't remember them. I started oh, watching you it. Need to watch Greatest Show in the Galaxy. It's amazing. I started watching it and it, I, I was finding it kind of tedious and turned it off. I know that might be sacrilegious. Oh. Yeah, I know. I always say I, I know. I always say that Fury from the Deep is my favorite episode, but I 
do think it's probably greater show in the galaxy. Because right. it sort of it just sort of goes off the rails. It's so eighties. It is so fucking eighties. That's why I couldn't get through it. It was like, uh, like uh, I remember the scene, and I think it's in part one. I think I only watched part one, like a bit of part two, where um, you see like it's just a shot of some steps, and then a foot appears on the steps, and it's like here's some eighties music, and you're like, this is the eighties. You, just, you need to watch that scene, anyone, because I, I, you can't do it justice in words. It's like this is the most oh, just, thing I've ever seen. Someone just put in. Someone just put in the chat. The robots are the autons. Maybe, maybe we got the autons trying to learn how to be humans. By, we've got a lot of what it means to be human in this season. Hmm. Which I mean, I guess that makes this fit. Yeah, because you know they, because you know they. Maybe maybe it's a bunch of autons that have lost the, have lost their nesting consciousness. Of course, this could also be um, an obscure universe for the Christmas special. That's true. Because then we don't really need a plot for it. Then we can just put it in there because it's a neat idea. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. I do I do really like it though. It's worthy of being its own story. It's also interesting, like, just to, just to, I guess, tangent a bit. I do find it interesting that we've got really a companion who has no frame of reference for where they might want to go in the universe. I mean, they know they're going to want to go to Earth, but that's pretty much it. They don't really have yeah, a concept of yeah, we've, going yeah, to the past got, or the future. We've only, we've only got, really got one episode uh, on Earth so far, haven't we? Yeah, should we do something else on Earth? Hmm. Let's do something set in Kilmarnock. <laughs> I don't know why that came to mind. Actually, no, I, I do know it came to mind, but um, oh god, I'm I'm gonna have to. I, okay, I'm gonna have to insist on an Auton episode where the Autons are learning how to be humans because I've thought of a title for it. Go on. Life in plastic. Is it's is there is there a reference here? As in, as in, life in plastic, it's fantastic, I'm a Barbie girl in a Barbie world. What if the Autons sing that in the, in the Christmas special? <laughs> I just, I want, I just, I want yeah, an episode sure. where all, Autons have lost the nesting consciousness and are learning how to be humans. But they, have they like retained some element of animation then? They've retained some element of animation and some like, and and they and they and they have some uh, they have like limit very limited reference points of what humanity is like. Life in plastic. I mean, we don't. If we, we can't, if we can't think of a story for this now, we don't have to. I mean, we've got less fleshed out episodes in the, in the previous season as well. This can be the shit one. This can be the shit. <laughs> so, um. Autons are trying to learn to be human uh, using... What was the show called? Uh, Watch with Mother. Watch with Mother. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to just be Watch with Mother. It's just like, uh, like they have very limited... Just like they have very limited materials to work with and they're trying yeah. to reconstruct how it is, how it, what it's like to be a human. I love the idea that... I love the idea of them landing in this, like... I, I like the idea that they land in this place where um, the Autons feel like they're there to serve. Like, they they await the return of... of um, the nesting. Uh, yeah. Or, like, anyone to just... Because um, they are built to be lapdogs. They're, they're built they're built purpose servants. Uh, that is essentially what they are. And they're just... They, they're waiting for the return of the nesting, but they, like, will settle for any organics. Yes. And they've learnt what life is from these TV shows. Yeah, essentially. Because, as may be obvious by this point, I am obsessed with TV shows and lots of what I write has TV themes. We've got... I mean, we've got... Um, 
Um, someone in the chat just requested I do a full cover of Barbie Girl. Um, while you write this up, I'm going to do that. Okay. Hang on. But we've not Hi, got a plot for it. Hi, Ken. You want to go for a ride? Sure, Ken. So, sorry, I won't do that. We've not got a plot that actually happens in this story yet. Um, and the, the obvious thing to do is that they're actually sinister and, and well, and, you know, uh, they serve you, but they also kill you. They're going to cut you up and use you to repair their ship or whatever. Oh, there could be... Actually, I like the idea... They want... They, they want lawn. They want Lorne's brain to be the new nesting. No, I like. I like the idea that because um, that's that's essentially you know that's the the girl in the fireplace. Yeah, essentially, yeah. I like the idea that they discover that the nesting. They, they are awaiting the return of the nesting consciousness. They yeah. um, meet. Uh, they uh, the doctor and Lorne arrive. But, uh, and the Autons go, oh, an organic, you must be the nesting consciousness, because that's the only criteria we have um, to assume that something is the nesting consciousness. So you two must be the nesting consciousness, right? We are here to serve you. What would you like? Right? Um, first of all, a former slave of being in this situation could be really interesting with purpose-built uh, servants, essentially. Her, her character can really be explored here. Not sure how, but, you know, we'll get to that when we actually write it rather than doing a brief overline. Um, but, uh... Which is going to happen, because as has been established, we are in charge of Doctor Who now. Yes, yes, yes. So send uh, us your death threats. But when they discover that the, uh... When they discover that the, uh... The, 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 uh my, my, I just need to engage my brain, hang on. When, it, when they actually realize that the Doctor and Lorne aren't the nesting consciousness, they get, they get mad and try to uh, feel that they have been deceived and want revenge on the Doctor and Lorne. Even though the Doctor and Lorne was just like, oh, you want us to boss you about? Okay, I guess. Yeah, that works. That works for a plot. So, you know, they're going, you have deceived us. You are not the nesting. We never said we were the nesting. You have deceived us. You are not the nesting. Uh, yeah, okay. They... Yeah, and it can be some big moment where um, the Doctor f first realises that, holy shit, they're talking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I do love the iconic sound of the the the, the, uh, the Auton gun. It's such a good noise. You, you can, anyone who already, anyone who's seen them already hears the noise. Um... Of the the gun opening and the hand like the, the the hand opening and the gun sliding out, it's good noise, sound design. Uh, Autons are trying to learn to be human. Not sure the word. They sing Barbie Girl. <laughs> well, I guess they could have seen it. Uh, I'm a blonde bimbo girl in a fantasy world. Dress me up, make it tight. I'm your dolly. You're my doll, rock and roll. For you the glamour and think, kiss me here. <laughs> the lyrics to this thing. Sorry, I've got the lyrics to Barbie Girl up on Google. I just want to. Okay, so I just want to look at how many of our. Because we've, we've got all but one story. We need an episode 10. That's it. Okay. Um. It can be shit, right? <laughs> um, here's... Oh, okay, here's a... There's a premise that I was playing around with for a while that I didn't really know how to, to, to fit in. I wanted to make this a story with Jody, but we didn't have enough slots for it, essentially, was it? Um, but I still think it's a very solid concept for a story, which is you go to the future, let's call it... Um, 2220, right? Um, right. It's to to uh, avoid having to predict what the future is going to be like. It's um, some secluded spot where, the, the, you know, um, that time has forgotten. Essentially, it's a uh, a little secluded society. Of, uh, let's say in Australia, it's a little Australian. They have villages there. They must do. 
The, the, what's the well, I have we have villages here, Joe. Yeah, but I want it to be in Australia. I do like Australia. Right, it's set in 2221. And uh, oh, it's, it is another returning... You know what? I think you're right in that we should um, ease on the returning villains because it's no, another... Well, not villain. It's another returning... The story would be essentially a social... Um, the, the Silurians have come back and they've actually surfaced and some of them are living on the surface now. And there's a huge social conflict between essentially human racists and Silurian racists. Um, I like that. I, I like that a lot. That does fit very much within the themes of the first season. Yeah. I, do, I do, do you want to do why... that? Do you, do you, do you think it, 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 do you think we have too many returning villains or do you think we should do that? I don't because it's like it's like it's like this little um you know what I don't I mean we're doing new things with them aren't we it does take them in a new direction all right you know what's you know what's a clever title I've had I've been sitting on this for years it's not even that clever fear of the Silurians because people are scared of them yeah okay and thing of the thing is like the how every classic Doctor Who story is named that's true. We don't actually have that many thing of the things, do we? How many things? We got the... we got memories of the Daleks in this one. What else did we have last season? Uh, okay, so we had lockdown, tomorrow's world, happy time, under under siege, the city of Santa, the uncle uh, untold case of Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde, silver salvation, the dawn of man doesn't really count. No, that would be dawn yeah, of the neither, man, wouldn't it? Neither the city of Santa really. Yeah. So no, we we didn't have any in. Uh, we didn't have any in our first season. No, oh, and the and the only one that we've got in this one, Memories of the Daleks, is the one with the weird, pretentious format. We also have uh, Planet of the the Kierans. Oh yeah, Planet of the Kierans. Yeah, Kiarans. Yeah, Kieran is also a name. We are just calling it Planet of the Karens. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah, you know what Karens do? They own slaves. <laughs> Oh my god, we've actually done that. We have done that. Oh, Jesus Christ. Um, Karen's own slaves and they want their Big Mac. Or whatever it was that that lady was saying on that video. I don't know. So yeah, so we've got Memories of the Daleks and Fear of the Silurians. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> 2021, there are huge social problems between... Uh, humans and Silurian factions, they're essentially big racist people on both sides of that divide. Because, you know, we've already had it established that a lot of Silurians don't like humans at all. And of course, when Silurians surface, there are going to be massive racists that hate the shit out of them. Oh yeah, totally. Um, um, Stay underground, Silurians. Uh, you know what I really don't want to do in this episode? I really don't want to make up a slur for Silurians. I I don't I don't want to take it down that road. I don't mm. want to, I don't want to draw that parallel. Oh, see, I did that in a story I wrote ages back, where I wrote like um, where I wrote kind of like a racial paradigm between humans and robots that have taken their jobs. Uh, this is like this is some of the kind of thing you have to be really, really careful writing, uh, because it's true, very yeah. easy to because there is very you know, it's about social tensions and people are obviously going to compare this to real racial tensions. Even though um, I have not deliberately in anything I've said so far tried to make an uh, allegory for real racial tensions that we currently have. You know, the last thing I would want to do is have a Silurian running around going, Silurian lives matter. I don't want to draw yeah, tensions of those... Like, I don't want to draw oh, like those in, kinds like of parallels. In, like in fucking Bright, where um, he's going, yeah. fairy lives don't matter today. That was the yeah, worst yeah, thing yeah. I've ever seen. Yeah. But, yeah, so I wouldn't want this to be um, explicitly allegorical for one real instance of racial tension in the real world. I would want this to be an examination of racial tensions in general and how uh, they affect people. How they affect individuals. 
I wouldn't want to do, hey, this is what's happening in the world. <laughs> like when they made the Zygons into ISIS. <laughs> to be fair, I like that one. Yeah, just the, 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 the flag was a bit on the nose, wasn't it? Yeah, the flag was a bit on the nose. And like the, the, the fact that they communicated through internet videos. <laughs> and the fact that and they made humans into electrified balls of pubes. Uh, yes, yes, they did. I just registered what you said because I was typing. I was like, hang on, that wasn't quite a normal sentence. That was funny. We've done it. We've got a season. How do we end this episode? Oh, we people, can't just... put, hmm? people are put, to be fair, the Silurians and the TV show did literally call the humans apes. That's true. But I, I mean, you know, I wouldn't want to uh, invent a slur for Silurians, but I am very happy with the Silurians going around calling the humans apes. Essentially, we want to we um, have a... Well, the humans can call them lizards. That's fine, isn't it? Or is yeah, that me being racist? I guess. But it's not like... I don't know. Oh, by the it way, would be I hard am to going, make I... lizard feel like a slur. Sorry, go on. By, by the way, I am going to insist that we end this stream by both of us singing Barbie Girl. Okay. I will allow you just, to insist just, that. Just, just, <laughs> just to make that clear now. <laughs> uh, right, okay. So... Uh, I'm just going to write some little notes for for this i don't actually have full no I've n i didn't write notes for in the world of the dead okay i'll um but we've done it i think yeah we've done it so we've got do a we... second season i guess how do we end fear of the silurians because we can't just go and then the doctor solved racism forever no more racism um... thank you the doctor how about okay, okay? This might be me going, me go, being going too far. How about the doctor solves one small domesticated case of racial tensions between Silurians and humans, and and um, him and Lorne are both like celebrating this. It's like, yeah, it's proof that humans and Silurians can live in peace. And then immediately it cuts to a news report of the next day of a racial racial attack between a um, racial conflict between Silurians and humans has ended with the death of a child. I, I'm going to say no. Yeah, <laughs> but... I, that's why I was joking at that. <laughs> that's why I openly said that was too much. But yeah, I, I, I understand the, the context in which in which you said that. It's okay. Um, right. The Doctor cancelled racists on Twitter. I guess I am okay with it just being, um, you know, they help out with an individual domestic. They, yeah, um... Cause that, cause that's how, that, that's, yeah, because that's how you, um, that, that, that's how you, um, flesh out a, flesh out a wide scale, wide scale problem by providing a small representative sample. They, yeah, they get a, um... Like a, yes, I have uh, Horus. There will be no child murder in this season. I also want to, <laughs> I also want to world build the shit out of this by having people in the Silurian makeup but wearing like human clothes and carrying like human weapons. I like that. Like a a, a Silurian radical wearing uh, like uh, a a human outfit and carrying an automatic machine gun. I, I that's a cool. There's a cool visual that you can put in all the trailers, not all the posters. Yeah. Because the, I want to make, I want to make a distinction between like the first generation of surfaced Silurians and the second generation of surfaced Silurians who were born into an existing world of uh, the the two peoples living side by side, but not not happily. I want that to be, you know, I want that to, that that difference to be explicit there, that there's the first and the second generation of them. Yeah. <laughs> a Silurian in a crop top and booty shorts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So uh, we could even have the uh, the episode start out with the doctor uh, seeing like a Silure in an, a restaurant or something, and going, oh, "What the fuck? You can't I'm... be up here." Yeah, exactly. Like, and the Silurian rolling his eyes, going, "I am allowed to be here." Because uh, he's used to that. He's used to like hearing people say that to him. Yeah. It's... Oh yeah, it's it's kind of like, it's kind of like in Future Armor where the mutants are aren't allowed to go to the surface world. <laughs> Yeah, I like I like that as a premise. I don't. I, I, it's like the it's a kind of ca- ha- it's a kind of premise you have to be super careful handling. But I do like it as a premise. Oh, and that's a, that's another question. Can Silurians shed their skin? I guess so. Yeah. Yeah, so they can shed their skin as well. They're reptiles. Yeah. Do all reptiles shed their skin? Yeah, Chuck. Do all reptiles sk- shed their skin? This will be the most reputable of all sources. Uh, uh, our chat. Yes. The Doctor does a racism sounds very scandally. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, yeah, like like with um, Spyfall, where she throws the Master to the Nazis. Well, yeah, but this would be a misinterpretation <laughs> rather than her deliberately <laughs> doing that. Yeah, rather than <laughs> deliberately doing that, This yes. would him be going, wait, the Silurians aren't supposed to be here, and he means in, like, a time sense he didn't know that the Silurians yeah. came out of the ground here. And the Silurian interprets him no, as like not going... No, not reptile shed their skin. Huh. Apparently. Um, and then the, the Silurian interprets that as the Doctor going, Silurians in my human space? No. But obviously that's not what he meant. The Silurians are supposed to reappear in 2020, lol. But it and is 2020. Twitter- and- and then Twitter tries to cancel the Doctor because they got the guy, they got footage of a racially motivated attack by this man in a branch of Starbucks. Uh, okay, we've got. I am um, just joking. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know. It's okay. Uh, hang on. Where are you? I forgot what I was going to say. Well. I don't know. Think like Chris Chibnall. Um, a b- 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 barbecue sauce. Let's spray the Silurians with barbecue sauce and the racism will go away. <laughs> Alright. Uh, Fuck it, that's the conclusion. Yeah, that's our, that's our season then. We've done a season yeah, again. We've done a season again. Maybe we'll do a, a season again again sometime. This is really yeah. fun, so I hope so. This is really, this is really fun. It's nice imagining that you have power. <laughs> oh, and then I guess we go to the Christmas special where we've got um aliens have hijacked the TV signal and the doctor and Lorne, who we now know and what kind of character she is and that she's there as well. Um it's all this big meta episode where they manage to steal the aliens camera and hijack the signal from the hijackers. And then, you know, it's it's a back and forth where the entire episode is told through what the humans would see as their hijacked TV signal. Which is the second time in this series that we've done, like a, here's a piece of media that would be exist in the Doctor Who universe. Yeah, but I, yeah, but I like that a lot. I like that, those types of concepts. Yeah, I, I do like it as well. I mean, I'm not, that wasn't a complaint. It's like, it's just a sort of an oddity, I guess. What I, we have, we have written enough now that like, the tropes of our writing appear. Well, it's good to have tropes. It's good to have... It's, it's oh, yeah, I'm have not saying it's a bad like. thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we did it. Give us money now. Well, I guess we could we could read out Super Chats and then we can go and, and summarise the, the series that we wrote. And then cover Barbie Girl. Yeah. Okay, okay, go for, go for it, Super Chats. Right, we've got... Um, I literally just finished watching the first stream yesterday, so this is a this is good timing. That must be really convenient. You know what I meant to do? I meant to tweet out yesterday that um, we're going to be doing this today, so that if you want to go watch the first one before we do this, that now would be the ideal time. But I forgot. So, um, yeah, I'm really smart. Because humans are flawed. Someone just sent in five bucks with uh, without a message. That's, that's appreciated. Thanks. 
And we've got, might be too close to Jody, but you could have the companion be the master and it's not revealed who they are until season three. No. And it's, it's always, it's like, it's a fine, like, idea, but I don't want to commit to something like that, you know? It's like, it's always, it's always been something that they could have done. Like, a lot of companions have been asked, are they the master? And it's always something that the show could do and would be good, I think. But uh, I don't want to commit to that with our one. Not too. It is. I'd, I'd agree that it is too close to Jody. I also, yeah. I also don't want to put the master in this because the master is dead canonically. Can't convince me otherwise. There is no. Uh, there is no new master. What are you talking about? Uh, the master died in uh, in in Capaldi's finale. The light bulb goes out in West of Drumlin's Revenge of the Weeping Angels. I just wanted to bring back Sally Sa uh, Sally Sparrow. She could be a cool returning character one day, yeah. No, I'm not so convinced. I think she works within the confines of Blink. She does, but there's like she's she's just a cool established character, I guess, that you could do stuff mm -hmm. with if you wanted to. Like you could bring back the characters from Love and Monsters and put them in a good story. I'd want to do that. We should do that. And the sometime. episode would be called Fuck You, Audience. <laughs> you know, I, like, I do really like the idea of bringing back the, uh, the, the child cast of the Sarah Jane Adventures, bringing, the, bringing back um, Luke, Clyde, and Rani for a, a standalone episode. Uh, making them like one-off companions. I, I do like that. Because they never got their TARDIS trip. Actually, you know what? I meant to mention this to you. For our next season, because this is always a thing that the Doctor Who, that Doctor Who does, right? Should we uh, format our next season differently? Hey, I think yes. our next series should be um, instead of a normal series of Doctor Who, three bigger serials, each of which would be released separately. Quite an interesting idea. So like three or three or four big serials of like three or four episodes each. Yeah, yeah, because those, yeah, because I, I do I do like when series do those experiments sometimes, like Torchwood did with Children of Earth. Yeah, yeah, I mean T Torch, uh, Children of Earth is fantastic. Yeah, like I, like I still remember I still remember watching that in 2010 when it first came out. Everyone was talking about it that one week. Oh, and then we should have, um, we should include a 60th anniversary special, I think, in our next one. Ooh, yeah, that's the point. Um, right, we've got... Uh, set, set on the 23rd of November, 1963. Because there are no other dates or years. You know, just to be meta, we could set it on uh, what's... Um, whatever date 1989 when the last episode of the classic series aired oh that would be nice uh, Jay, Stu I've been thinking about um, the Dalek prison episode since you guys pitched it the words I've sentenced you to live keep uh, kicking around in my head that's cool because it, it, it is what the um, it is what the, the, the person is doing to the Daleks, because the Daleks would prefer to die in that situation. But he's forcing them to stay alive. Oh, so are you ready for the last two super chats? They're great. Okay, go for it. Uh, we've got from Squidward, PP. Pee -pee. <laughs> and then from, uh, from Mean Green Slovene, we've got Poo Poo. And that was them. That was the Super Chats. Hooray! The Super Chaunts. Unless, right. there, unless, unless people are about to add some more just to fuck with us. I mean, I wouldn't protest. That was an invitation. <laughs> so we've got... Um... Okay, let's let's go through. Should we, should we alternate who, who does each episode again? We did that last time. Um, I think it's probably a good idea to do it for... I think, I think it's probably good, good to do it for... Do it, whoever's, whoever principally came up with the idea does it. I then. guess, yeah. 
and we can we can both add things when when there are just, details that are important to us yeah so uh starting out with our christmas special for really the previous season because we didn't bother with it at the time because <laughs> we told a complete story um this is our our solo doctor um uh, encounters a weapon with with his TARDIS in flight that uh, is designed to get TARDISes out the way. This is a weapon that fucks with the TARDIS's navigation system and reroutes it so uh, so that it can only materialize in obscure and unlikely timelines, uh, essentially keeping it out of the main universe, um, which is the function of the weapon. In these obscure timelines, the Doctor finds that the Rani has also been trapped there and the two work together to escape. As they uh, as they work their way through these weird uh, reimaginings of what the Doctor Who universe could be. Essentially, they work their way, their way through Elseworlds, where the Cybermen, uh, for example, uh, knock on your door and ask you to talk about Jesus. Also, the Rani is the Rani. <laughs> that's the twist that, that's, that'd be a great meta joke to include at some point in there <laughs> I'm just imagining now a, like it's a Scooby Doo episode where um, the Rani is where the Doctor has got the Rani tied up and then um, he tears the Rani's face mask off and goes the Rani was the Rani the whole time Oh, I do love that. Why are people so into speculating that the Rani's going to come back? Are there that many devoted Rani fans, or is Classic Who really just out of villains to, to revive? I think it is just out of villains, but but people were doing that just bef- even before the, they did the Ice Warriors and the Silurians. Who were they predicting would be the Rani then? I think that... I, I can't even remember. I just know that the Rani kept on getting talked about, even before they did the Ice Warriors and the Silurians. Bring back the Rani. It's a shame. I, I was um I was hoping that we could get the original Rani back, and then I I found out that she passed away. Yeah, okay, Samara passed away. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know that. I, I do want to have a a rule in here that uh while Alan Rickman isn't alive either, I don't think we should say, oh yeah, the original actor can play the character who we're bringing back when the original actor has passed away. I feel like that's. Not, I don't feel like I was crossing a moral line. I feel like we can, you know, it's fine to to speculate. Oh, it would be great if this actor was alive to play this part. Uh, but I, I feel it's like, I don't know. I kind of feel like it's cheating because like we, there's no way would be we would be able to do this because with Alan, obviously, if we actually made this, we would just cast someone else. But when you bring back uh, a character who depends on a certain actor to play them, we can't just go. Oh, we'll just cast someone else. It's fine. Someone in the, someone just sent a super chat of um, a monster biting on a one-up. Very cool. Thank you, person. All right. Episode one of our new series, then, um, is called Planet of the Kierans, of the Kiarans, um, which ha- uh, where the uh, the TARDIS lands on the on this uh, previously unestablished planet. And the Doctor um, remarks that he's been brought here by the TARDIS. The TARDIS has decided that he should come here, and he doesn't know why. Um, <clears throat> there he meets two human slaves, uh, and is presumed to be a slave himself, uh, because uh, because he is not a Kiaran, the native species, who keep slaves, because they're not very nice. Um the uh there the two human slaves are uh, a younger woman uh L- lawn i forgot her fucking name lawn lawn yes uh and an older gentleman who i don't think we gave a name no we did give him a name but i've forgotten it what did we name him wilfred no we named him mace didn't we mace yes mace yeah we named him mace um so uh mace is very ill and near death uh, which will make Lorn the only, as oh, what she thinks, the only human left uh, here. Of course, she's thrilled to see the Doctor when he arrives um, and asks help. Uh, he, uh, She and Mace want help because Mace loves the feeling of uh, the sun on his skin. 
Uh, but he can only experience it through the glass of a window in the place that he lives because he's not legally allowed to go outside in his society. So uh, the doctor helps Lorne uh, sneak Mace outside so that he can feel the light of the sun on his skin uh, without the glass in the way. And he's like, you know what? It feels exactly the same, but I'm glad we did it anyway. Uh, and then he takes on Lorne as a new companion because the alternative is leaving her there where she would go back into a life of slavery with her only real friend now gone. Uh, he, she is a reluctant companion because he is still m grieving his previous companion and he blames himself for her death. So he is worried that he is going to cause the death of a new companion if he takes on a new companion. But this circumstance kind of dictates it. She is now a live-in TARDIS companion. Stu, did you have something to write there? I heard vaguely stew sounding noises. No, those are just the noises that I emanate. Ah, okay. Uh, so we um, now have... Yeah, we now have we a got... companion on board, and it's your episode. Episode two is called Where Am I? Um, and this episode starts out with a businesswoman... Um, going on a flight to uh, meet a client in New York and her plane randomly about halfway through her flight her plane randomly gets the captain announces that they're going to have a layover an emergency layover in Myeloja a country that she's never heard of before and she ends up getting she ends up getting trapped in the airport with the doctor and companion and she's confused she doesn't she's never heard of this country before it just sort of seems to have appeared out of nowhere and it's got all these very, all these weirdly familiar fixtures in it, like Starbucks and a Burger King. And she has no idea why she's never heard of this country before. And uh, it turns out over the course of the doctor and companion and some this businesswoman investigating over the course of the episode that this is actually an alien planet. Um, the plane is full. The plane, plane is full of alien passengers who have taken up residence in Earth for uh, it who have um, taken up residence on Earth and they t take these regular flights between Earth and this country um, in and um, this country on an alien planet. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something annoying. Okay, go on. I'm going to switch the order between uh, this and Welcome to Earth. Okay, go on. Yeah, actually, I agree with that. I agree with that. Um... I agree with that because this is sort of, this is sort of transitioning us from Earth-like to um, alien-ish. Plus, um, I'm just making up words at this want, point. You want you want the um, the companions' first trip. You want to sort of see it from their perspective right at the start. Yes, uh, you I don't agree, want yeah. an you don't want an episode that starts with them already there until later. I don't think. And even then, I think where am I should probably introduce uh, should probably show them arriving and being like, oh, what's this place? You know. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Okay, so episode two is now welcome to Earth. Which is a, which is mostly mostly just a character piece, so that we can explore, we can have fun with Lawn interacting with, Earth with general fixtures of the Earth. Yeah, and it's uh, it's a fun. You're gonna have fun fish out of water jokes where this. Uh, first of all, it's gonna be really fun to see her being free. It's gonna be really fun to see her curiosity, her learning about Earth through the eyes of someone who's never seen it. And only vaguely knows that she must come from some other planet somewhere else. Her finally getting taken there and getting to explore it is going to be really fun to see. And the plot is there is a fake bomb threat. Yes, yeah, so they are in a business. We didn't decide what that business was. We were going to say it was a museum, but they're not businesses, so it, it doesn't really work with a museum. Uh, a shopping centre? Um, uh, yeah, that works. A shopping centre works. Because the shopping center is evacuated, and then the doctor is like, "I'm a, I'm in the bomb squad," and he gets to stay inside as it's, uh, as it's shut down. Yeah, basically, this is a fun, silly little episode. And I think that he should encourage Lorne to go with the evacuees because he's very ner nervous about um, not losing a companion and but, putting um, her in danger. Yeah. Uh, but I think that she should insist that because she is terrified of getting separated from him and losing him. Because she has no ties, she has no knowledge of this planet. Uh, so I think she should be very insistent that that doesn't happen. 
and that's why because you know that's that's what the doctor would do and uh that needs to be overcome because there needs to be a reason they stay together the bomb top, yeah. the bomb plot does turn out to be fake um and staged by an opposing business trying to hurt business for the mall that they are pretending to bomb and the doctor manages to expose this conspiracy to uh, relevant authorities and people so that the business doing bad things gets bad things happen to them instead but not fake bomb threats because that would be wrong right you're halfway through describing where am i i think episode uh, three uh, is called where am i yeah uh, yeah where am i is um Basically, so um, this so this random random human woman accident. What what it what it actually is is um, these flights are being arranged between Earth and this new country on this on this alien planet, Myloja, um, and there's, there are only supposed to be aliens on this flight commuting between Earth and Myloja, um, but this but, but this businesswoman has ended up there by mistake. So. <laughs> Me making me making vaguely two sounding noises sounding noises again. So yeah, she's ended up on this flight by mistake. Oh, and... um, the the planet needs to be renamed. Oh yes, that's true. The planet needs to be named. The, the, no, the planet is Iowa. Yeah, the planet is Iowa. And yeah, it's a the detour country. To... The it's country a... is Myloja. The oh, planet yeah, okay. is Iowa. Oh, I like that. Planets actually do have countries. That's a thing that happens. World buildings yeah. do. Yeah, and it's got these vaguely vaguely Earth seeming fixtures on it, like Burger King and Starbucks. Yeah, um, be yeah, because they've been brought there by the uh, this this, and this yeah. this the company running the flight is a third party. This is the aliens that the um, uh, that they're in contact with on Iowa. The these aren't um, the the Eowans themselves making the, yeah. the these flights. Yeah, and it's a mystery story. It's the Doctor and this what, random woman uncovering it. Yeah, and I feel that. Um, it could use uh, for a little more conflict. The the people who ran the flight realize that this is just a human on the plane and want to detain her. Uh, and yeah. The doctor has to help her get home. Yes. Yeah. Last minute addition, more story. You know. Yeah. We haven't. Like that. We haven't. This it's not really last minute. You know. This in the writing room. This is what we would call a first outline. Um. So yes, um, the Doctor is keen on... We don't actually get that yet, I guess. No, the Doctor is keen on... Uh, Hang on, where are we up to? We're up to the Overseers, right? We're, we're on episode three still, but the Doctor is keen on... Um, on Lorm going back to... On Lorm going back to... I've, put, I've written her name as Lorm. Why do I keep doing that? The Doctor is keen on Lorm going uh, back to Iowa because she, she likes it on Iowa. Um, so when when she asks to go back, which I guess would happen at the end of o the Overseers, because episode five is entirely just a documentary. Yeah. Um, he's keen on it because he wants to push her away, and him learning to not want to push her away anymore is an arc of the season. Yeah. So the doctor the doctor takes her back to Earth in the Overseers, but yes, she's more interested in Iowa. Yeah. She like she's really interested in both. She. Well, she's really interested in both and exploring the world with the Doctor, but she wants to... But she does want to go back and, like, go back to these cool places. Yeah. She she wants to explore everywhere, really, and, and is, has a, a curiosity about the world. Yes. She's, in many ways, perfect companion material, but the Doctor wants to push her away. Yeah. Because of what happened before. Yeah. Do you want to do the overseers? Okay, and episode four is um, my, one of my babies, where um, the Doctor meets Kafka because our Doctor is a um, literary nerd, and uh, he basically meets Kafka while he's being subject to straight uh, subject to a strange alien trial by um, a legal department full of aliens who want to study how humans behave when they're put under strange, ridiculous, ridiculous social pressure and examination. Basically, this, there's this department of aliens that operate in these attics on Earth. Yes. It's it's fun. It's like, this is another lighthearted... This is basically... A lot of this is basically a full season of our lighthearted first half of the previous season we did. Yeah, essentially. But we do have this, big things in it. Yeah, and this one, this one is um, 
I mean, I've, essentially, I've just taken the trial and put it in and made it into a Doctor Who story in some way. But, it, but I, th- I think the themes the themes of it work because I think the themes of it work in this context because in this season the Doctor's like the Doctor the Doctor's examining examining his past actions and blaming himself, and that's essentially the themes of the trial. The Doctor goes back in time and meets Douglas Adams. Yes, if we're if we're gonna continue doing our um, literary heroes thing, he, he was. It turns out that when he was written, he, when he wrote "City of Death," he was surrounded by the Doctor. Yes. <laughs> is this too meta? No. Um, and no, then it's he, not too meta. Episode Nothing five is, is your baby as meta. well. Hang on, what have you cut off? I said episode five is your baby as well. Oh, do you yeah, want, episode you, five is my baby as well. Uh, and, this and, is Memories of the Daleks. Hmm. It is a fake documentary program made by um, people on Iowa, uh, talk, documenting um, the time when their planet was invaded by uh, the Daleks in the past, about twenty years ago. So it's I like feel like it should be longer ago than that. Yeah, I, maybe I want... like fifty years ago, and it's like it's like full of archive materials, like footage of. The Eowyns breaking into um, a Dalek gestation chamber, and like the Doctor and Lorne show up in interviews talking about, oh, that time that yeah we um we got rid of the Daleks from this planet. I also want it to be like not a full scale invasion, but more of a like a they're seizing resources from this place. Yeah, because the Daleks do have huge power over uh, over the Eowyns or over the Mildreds. Who um, are not as technologically, you know, they don't they don't have uh, space travel or anything. I like so how wouldn't... we just called them the Mildreds just because the word Mildred is in my head. Well, that's for some where else are you going to get names? Um, so yeah, the... there needs to there needs to be an episode that explains why the word Mildred is in my head for no reason. Do it. Um, yeah. So um, I'm almost feeling like a hundred years ago. Yeah, I just like the idea of it being a fake documentary. Yeah, it is a fake documentary with archive footage from a uh, hundred years ago, with interviews uh, from the Doctor in it, uh, and he can be credited as like uh, Dalek knowing about person and his friend, expert expert Dalekologist. Uh, then we've got uh, I do I do kind of like that one of our world building episodes for Iowa isn't really set there it is just about there though you know yeah. it's, well, it, 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 I guess it is set there all of the events take place there but you know what I mean and I do like that we have had two Dalek stories now to build them up but without actually doing a Dalek story because one of them happened a long time ago and it's like you know they're not around anymore where have they gone and one of them is uh we are prick teasers yeah exactly we're building up to a, a big dalek story that we'll do eventually i feel like the first uh proper dalek story we do could be the big like bombastic climax for our doctor not necessarily in fact i know not the regeneration because i i know what i want to do for the regeneration but sort of like uh, the regeneration would be the epilogue after the climax, uh, a, a smaller self-contained story that uh, acts as sort of a character send-off. Yeah. Um. <sighs> then, okay, so okay, and we are we are building. Of course, we are building uh, the relationship between the Doctor and Lorne this whole time. Uh, we are getting them close we're getting them to depend on each other that's really important uh for the doctor to recover so we've got uh episode six and seven is our first and only, it's only one of two two parters in this series which is a lower than normal amount uh episode six and seven are called the frozen wastes and beneath the ice um it's a complete coincidence that the ice warriors are also in it i promise i didn't mean for that to happen shut up um so uh, the doctor and Lorne land on a uh, desolate uh, glacial planet which is nothing but uh, ice above a fro- um, 
above an ocean. So, you know, a layer of ice and underneath it is the, is the ocean. Uh, and in that ocean is something sinister. The ice warriors are here uh, to try and uh, make uh, a new place where they can live because Mars died. Hey, remember how Mars died? Yeah, that's canon in Doctor Who that the ice warriors used to live on Mars, but then it died and now it's all desolate and they don't live there anymore. So they had a space program where they sent loads of uh, last ditch attempts to, to preserve the ice warrior civilization. Uh, they, they sent uh, a group of ice warriors to loads of different planets with resources and rations to hopefully reseed a new livable planet. It's later revealed in the episode that how did they find, how did they choose which planets to send these ice warriors to? Well, they had a map from a crashed uh, starship, which was uh, built by a race called the Exelons, which are also Doctor Who canon. Um, and they are a race, it's, it's just canon that they were around in, uh, in prehistory and they went to, uh, or in just history, they went to Earth um, so they, they could reasonably have gone to Mars as well. A crashed ship there has a navigation system on it, uh, which has a load of planets marked um, uh, as points of interest, or so they thought. The Ice Warriors went and went to these planets specifically because they were points of interest. But the Doctor knows, and because he can read the actual language, that they are not marked as points of interest, they are marked as danger, stay away. And under the ice lives a huge creature that the Exelons have taken a great deal in trapping there. Uh, they even use one of their big power-sucking beacons to, to suck its, its energies. And it goes boom, boom. Lots of sucking going on. Yeah, there's lots of sucking. Uh, this is the this is the fellatio episode. Um, so uh, this creature uh, lives under the ice. You get glimpses of it. The whole point is to have sort of a slow build mystery where you never really see the creature. Um, it's a, it's essentially horror. Uh, it's atmosphere horror though. It's not gore horror. Uh, the light, so the the creature has a light that accompanies it that comes from under the ice. This light shines from under the ice. Think Europa Report because that exact thing happens in Europa Report, and I love that film. And yeah, <laughs> but uh, the uh, the light isn't well, evil. Been on my list for a while. I should watch it. The light isn't ev the evil thing in Europa Report. It's not an evil infectious light. I've done an original. Um, so yeah, there's a light that comes from under the ice, and it uh, gets in people's eyes and makes them want to kill each other uh, so yeah you got all of these ice warriors going nuts uh killing themselves and each other when this ice gets in their when this light gets in their eyes uh but it's not just that the light gets in their eyes for a second it starts getting in their eyes you cut away it's implied that something more happens and then uh, they you, the next time you see them they start killing the last scene of the episode um sees the doctor trying to escape with the surviving ice warriors um and they're back to the TARDIS the door is open the doctor just takes tries to take one last look at this creature that they're trying to escape from because he has no idea what he is and he's got a burning curiosity about it and he just sees the light coming from the ice and the creature's silhouette as like this this light is flashing from behind it and he sees a few flashes of the silhouette before he's dragged into the TARDIS by lawn um and you see the last thing you see isn't the flashes of light; it's his face as he looks at it and sees something that you're not seeing. Uh, and the next episode is an important character-building episode for Lorn and the Doctor, where Lorn persuades the Doctor after they've dropped off the Ice Warriors on some space planet, a safe safe planet. You know where they can drop them off? They can drop them off on Iowa, Iowa even, not Iowa. <laughs> Iowa is the state in the United States of America. Yes. Um, so Sorry, yeah. it's been four hours. This is the yeah, I, 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 I understand. But yeah, they can uh, they can drop the ice warriors off on uh, Iowa. I guess that's a cool place where ice warriors would be accepted and allowed to live. Aliens already live on Iowa. But um, yes, we've got uh, the passenger. Uh, Lorne persuades the Doctor after seeing, after he looked into the light that was driving those other Ice Warriors crazy, uh, to go and get a checkup. So he goes to like this advanced futuristic, futuristic alien hospital. 
where he's checked up. He's like, oh yeah, I'm a Time Lord. I looked into this weird light that was being emitted by this creature and I don't know what it was, but it was driving some of these Ice Warriors crazy. Um, can you can you check up on me, please? Um, the initial tests show nothing, um, but it's a slow build, again, suspenseful sort of horror piece. Um, and by the end of the piece, uh, the, the light has fully manifested itself in the Doctor, and he's going nuts and trying to... He's gone homicidal uh, because he's possessed by this creature. Uh, the hospital there has the technology to exercise the creature from him. Um, and Lorm it has her moment to shine, helping to save the day from the Doctor because the Doctor isn't there and he's been possessed. Uh, so she has to step up on her own and save people. Uh, with the help of the medical staff, of course. But, you know, she's she's not got the Doctor with her. And uh, the Doctor is exercised, and an important contrast to the previous season, um, where the Companion completely stopped trusting the Doctor, in this season, when the Doctor has a, a, an issue, Lorne goes, uh, Lorne goes, it's okay, I know it wasn't you, I still trust you completely. Which takes us to episode 9, Life in Plastic. Which is my silly idea of um, the Doctor and Lorne show up in... Um, on in an alien in an alien colony where which is populated by autons, who their nesting consciousness has vanished, and these autons are using very limited very limited resources um, to learn how to become human. Um, they're using old tele old television shows, and they and they're using those as sort of a template to try to to, to try and imitate what human human society is like. And it's basically an excuse to do lots of meta jokes, as in th this is how this is how a lump of plastic would imitate imitate what a human looks like, um, what how how human in how humans interact with each other. And these autons, because the Doctor and Lorne have shown up and they're fleshy creatures, the autons think, oh, these must be our new nesting consciousness. So um, they uh, take commands from Lorne and the Doctor. Um, up until up until the point where they realize up until the point where they realize that wait this this isn't the nesting consciousness we've just been taking orders from we've just been taking templates and orders from these two creatures that have just show, that have just shown up and that's where the conflict arises from um i mostly wanted to do this episode because um the idea of lumps of plastic imitating what they think humans humans are like from old broadcast materials is funny to me and as some people may have noticed I've called it Life in Plastic as a reference to the Aqua song, uh, as a reference to the Aqua song Barbie Girl. Because, um, you know, they're, they're um, plastic imitating life. Yes, I, I love this one. This yeah, I, I think it would be funny to see. It's it's silly and might be shit, but... It's like, as it's, there's just a lot of, like, this could be a light-hearted classic, you know? Like Seeds of Doom is. I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it on the same level as Seeds of Doom. <laughs> but like, well, you know, it depends on. It depends on the writing chops that go into it. Because Seeds of Doom, I would if I heard Life in Plastic's premise and Seeds of Doom's premise, I'd probably go with Life in Plastic, because Seeds of Doom one. <laughs> is made by. Um, is is made by Tom really? But you know, it, it's made by the strength of its characters. Yeah. Seeds of Doom is um, a great showcase of the Fourth Doctor, and um, it has a very good story, but not an exceptional story. You know, it's it's a story that functions to facilitate loads of really cool things within it. It's just this; it just has yeah. the spirit of Doctor Who, which is what makes it so good. And this absolutely is a premise that has so much space for the premise for the spirit of Doctor Who. Yeah. I, I, I do imagine our Doctor as a guy who does, you know, sort of fuck with people in the same way that Tom would. Yeah, true. yeah, I agree with that. I wouldn't want him to just do a Tom impression, but that's a very important part of the Doctor to me, is someone who doesn't really give a shit how he's perceived um, and will just openly fuck with people. Um, like in Seeds of Doom, where he... he uh, he meets Mr. Chase, 
and starts introducing everyone to Mr. Chase, including Mr. Chase's own employees. And Mr. Chase has to shut him up going, yes, thank you, Doctor, we are already acquainted. It's it's just little moments like that with Tom that really, I love his Doctor. I, I love his Doctor oh, so I much. Should watch, I should watch Seeds of Doom again. Yeah, watch Seeds of Doom. It's like my favourite. Um... We've got episode 10, Fear of the, of the Silurians. Uh, is just a fun premise. It's, um, it's, the year is 2021. No, sorry, it's not. It's 2221. Um, and Silurians have emerged from under the earth and are now living in Australia. This isn't like a huge number of Silurians or anything. This is like maybe, you know, a population of a few thousand live in Australia. Right? Uh, where racial tensions... This is also a great excuse to have uh, Silurians with Australian accents. Because, um, of course, second generation Silurians born after are, are going to adopt that accent, I, I would assume. Um, right, but... Yeah, you'd assume so. We've got um, huge racial tensions between essentially human racists who don't want any don't want, don't want the Silurians near them and Silurian racists, as previously established in the show, who just want the humans gone so they can have their planet back. Uh, and it's about it's an exercise in learning to share. <laughs> but yes, the the actual sharing, sharing. the actual story is the Doctor sorting out an individual domestic between. Uh, yeah, it's it's not him solving all of racism no, ever. Yeah, it's he doesn't him solve solving racism. A, an indivi an individual domestic dispute between a Silurian family and a human family. Yeah. Uh, just a small, sweet little story about learning to live together. Now we've got episode 11, This Is My Baby, um, In the World of the Dead. The only notes I took, took <laughs> Adric is back, because I guess I just, I, I wasn't writing notes for this one, I just remember it. So the Doctor receives um, some literature uh, in the TARDIS. That, oh, I've completely forgot to mention why I was mentioning the translation stuff. Uh, when I was originally mentioning the trans... Fuck it, you know. Uh, there's a mistranslation of the TARDIS circuits, right? Uh, it just shows a discrepancy in the translation between what uh, Lorne hears and what the Doctor hears, as is possible when, you know, concepts are being translated to people who have completely different languages in their heads. You know? It's not always going to be a one-to-one -one translation. So they, they notice a slight discrepancy in the in the translation. The Doctor receives literature for a haunted house, which he thinks, hey, could be fun. He goes there um, to discover that it's, uh, that it's a, you know, a building of alien design um, and no one else there. But there's other places laid out for him and there's other places laid out uh, and other guests are expected. The first uh, other guest to arrive is Adric, uh, a companion from the fifth Doctor's era who died um, trying to save the world from the Cybermen. Uh, he, um, the, the Doctor is meeting essentially an aged version of Adric that never got to exist because Adric died as a teenager. Um, the, the house is made up of, uh, essentially, is allowing the Doctor to speak to his memories, is allowing the Doctor to, sp to speak to his perception of dead people that he's known. Um... And the closest translation, because this isn't a concept that exists on either Gallifrey or Earth, the closest translation that the Doctor saw when he was seeing the literature for it was Haunted House. It was a mistranslation from the TARDIS that saw the literature promoted as a haunted house. Uh, and that's, that's the ending revelation, essentially. But um, these, uh, these, uh, he, he keeps being joined by friends he's known that have died such as Harriet Jones, Lucy Miller, <coughs> um, Adric, Bill Potts, uh, not Clara, she can go away, um, Missy, uh, Sarah Kingdom. Lucy Miller. Oh, I said Lucy Miller. Oh yeah, sorry. And uh, this whole time, because we had a companion die last season, there's one big place at the head of the table and we all know who who's going to be sitting in that place when that place is filled, and it's Jody Queen, uh, and all of these people essentially act as a horde because they are his perception of uh, of the dead people he's known, and he's feeling very insecure because he feels he's caused a friend's death. 
So because he is talking to his perception of his dead friends, they all start immediately blaming him for their deaths, berating him, um, trying to kill him. Uh, and Lorne, who is the only real person there, uh, has to help him out and tell him, no, it's not your fault. Uh, you've been alive so long, people have died around you, and you can't save literally everyone. That's not up to you. Um which helps him fix his perceptions of people that have died around him for the time being. And he ends up having a nice heart-to-heart -heart discussion with his perception of Adric that he's essentially reanimated in his head. And just having a, a sort of reminisce on old times with Adric. Also, Benny is there. <laughs> Benny! <laughs> was that in the chat or was that you? Um, someone did put the war Benny in the chat, so that was... That, that just thought... That, that just thought prodded me into saying it you can take credit for that joke that's that's I'll, take, I'll take credit for it i was the i was the first one that some said that uh, said the timeless child is the war benny <laughs> i also enjoyed when you said that uh i can't remember what it was but in our rick and morty stream when you made reference to the war morty that was fun <laughs> uh um but okay we've got then got our finale which is basically going to be the least finale finale that we've well, I was going to say that we've ever done. We've done one other one. But, uh... We've, yeah, we've got, um... We've got our finale. Uh, which is The Alien and the Ruins. Set on Eowa, the reoccurring setting of the season. Uh, I've called her fucking Lorm again. Why do I keep calling her Lorm? The Doctor and Lorm, um... Are greeted on, uh... On landing on Eowa, the Doctor and Lorne are greeted by authorities there who take them to meet someone who looks a lot like them because they think that they would have an interest in that. Turns out there's been a human living on uh, Eowa this whole time. And, uh... Hang on. When, when they open the door to this human, this, this human gets a knock on their door, sees two other humanoid people standing there and it's like oh my god you know i've never seen another person like me before uh and the the a big part of this episode is acting as a character examination of this uh person who has been left on earth uh as a, uh, not on earth on eowa as a child uh, and doesn't know why we should probably have an explanation in there so that people don't uh, speculate about it because it's not a mystery box it's just it's a a reason to have this uh this character here it's not there to be a mystery box. You know, if we if we set that up... A, a, hmm? par a, parent, a, par a parent space traveler dumps the child on Iwa and says, I don't want you. And then it will be like a sad thing. Yes. <laughs> I don't fucking know. <laughs> Look, there needs to be an explanation in there, but it's not really important for what we're trying to convey with it. You know, we would we would have to sit down and figure this out properly if we were actually making this season but we're not so fuck it yes but the, the important thing is that it's explained why he's there we called him fred didn't we i like fred um i think the joke could be I like a good humany name yeah i think the joke could be that that also was just by coincidence a um a name that they have in their culture as well and that's where he got it how about barry <laughs> I like Barry. Um, yeah, so he's uh, he's called yeah he's called uh, he's called Barry, and he uh, yeah so he gets to so it's it's an exploration of his character for a lot of it, but also the authorities want uh, something else from the Doctor and Lorne. They're aliens, and they want to. Uh, wonder if they might have any insight on the ancient alien spaceship ruins that exist and have existed for a very long time on uh, the planet of Iowa. Uh, so they're taken there and the story is essentially just this self-contained thing where uh, the Dr. Lorne and Barry is also there but he's not really helping, he's just there. He's, he's there as sort of a, a, an episode-only companion. Um... In fact, you know, the conclusion to this video would be that he won't... This video, this episode would, uh, along some of the others, as the Doctor and Lorm are leaving, 
Lom, I called it fucking Lom again, Christ. Um, as the Doctor and Lorne are leaving, uh, Barry would say, you know, I don't want to leave my home, but come visit, yeah? Uh, so, yes, because he wants to, you know, he wants to, he doesn't want to be completely cut off from other human beings and, or humanoids. But, um, it's this archaeology thing where they are trying to get into the, the spaceship. Uh, and because the Doctor does give them extra insight on the, the ruins uh, and tells them where to find a load of extra rooms in the spaceship that they hadn't found previously and were buried underground. Uh, this is where all the security stuff is. This is like, I guess, the, the ship's vault. So uh, the Doctor helps them through the security systems, which are very dangerous. One um, security system really hits the Doctor and Lorne, uh, and they don't understand why. And it doesn't hit Barry. They, they, it's like, it's this, uh, it's like, you know, this mental torture thing, essentially. This mental, like, you know, essentially the, the mental equivalent of tear gas. It's like projecting pain directly into the mind. And it hits, uh, Lorne and the, the Doctor, but not Barry. Uh, so the Doctor helps the, uh, the archaeological team, uh, helps them survive. They get the findings that they want. And um, as as they're leaving, the the last scene of the of the season is the Doctor going to lawn. So uh, I figured out why uh, the security system was hitting us and not Barry. Um, it's designed to target Time Lords, and that's the nice little the reveal at the end of the season that is why the, this is actually the last episode because it has a big reveal in it. Lorne is actually a Time Lord. And that was why the TARDIS brought the Doctor to Lorne at a time in his life when he really needed someone. Yeah. Needed someone familiar. And we've got... Uh, yeah, that, 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 and that's that's the season. We've also got the Christmas special about aliens hijacking a Earth's TV signal and it's told through the medium of that hijacking, essentially. So you'd see the BBC One ident or whatever you know channel this is going out on um and then the announcer would get cut off by like static and you'd see um an alien's face going greetings people of earth we have hijacked your television signals we are broadcasting on all channels uh and then a little guy goes up to him and goes you know whispers in his ear and goes apparently we could only get the one channel <laughs> but this is very important for the survival of your species so don't change the channel uh, and uh, yeah, and the, there'll be lots of meta broadcasting related. Jobs yeah, and, and the doctor is able to. The doctor shows up on the spaceship that they're broadcasting on, uh, and it's all told from the perspective of this one camera that they started using to broadcast on. And it's this fun little run around on a on an alien spaceship with the doctor and Lorne. Why is the name Barry so funny to me? It's such a normal person name. <laughs> But, you know, having the alien Barry. <laughs> That's our season. We did it. We've but got... spelt wrong with, like, all apostrophes and everything. Well, spelt in an alien alphabet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think we had another super chat coming then. We did. We had, uh... Bring back the Ood as... Hang on. Like, it's too far away from me. I need to bring my laptop closer to read it. Bring back the Ood... And a miserable cosmic horror. A miserable cosmic horror? That's what it says. What, what do you think that means? Miserable cosmic horror? Um, some sort of demon alien thing that wants to make people miserable? I guess, cos just, I guess just a miserable cosmic the horror The metaphysical story. embodiment of depression. Dope. Oh, there was a premise that I wanted to do for a while, actually. Oh, this would be fun to do in the next season. Is a... Uh... You know the Doctor Who trope of a, a, fe a creature that feeds on your fear? Yeah. Uh, a creature that feeds on anger and is trying to make little... Um, is trying to... Is infiltrated the internet and is trying to make people angry. <laughs> well, that'd explain a lot of things. Exactly. It was aliens, except most of it wasn't aliens and people are just shit. But an alien did some of it. 
That can be a premise Radiant, in, in season Radiant three. Radiant did some of it. Also, also, it killed a child somehow. Yeah. Because drama. And we've got, here is money's love your content, Jay. Thank you. And the bottom one says, hashtag Stan Barry. The bottom what? The, bo- the bottom chat. It just said, hashtag oh, it Stan does. Barry. I love it. I'm gonna make that. I'm gonna make that a thing now. Hang on. <laughs> Hashtag Stan Wait. Barry. I mean, Barry would be a great. Since we're going back to um, Iowa, Barry would be a great returning character. Yeah, he would. I would like that in season three. And I've just tweeted hashtag Stan Barry. Probably See if also, anyone gets that. We also probably want some returning uh, uh, Mildreds as uh, characters as well. Are they, you know? Couple That's of... probably a good idea. Uh, while I'm while I'm busy tweeting out stuff that we're saying on this stream, um, I remember, I remember after uh, the last stream that we did, where we did that whole Reginald from Nigeria thing, um, and I changed my Twitter name to Re- Reginald from Nigeria. And then I woke up in the morning and I had thought of a serious point that I wanted to make, <laughs> and I tweeted out this serious point. And then it took me until lunchtime before I realised that my display name was still Reginald from Nigeria. <laughs> That's great. Oh, I love that. I hope it didn't cause you too much of a problem. Um, no, no one mentioned it, but I did change it back as soon as I realised. Oh, that's funny. All right, I, this has been what, what, how far, how long have you been doing this now? This has been uh, well over four hours. Oh, we're into five much. hours, I think. Yeah, close to five hours. Bloody hell! I didn't think this would be longer, but we went in more detail because we're amazing writers. Yes, give us money now, specifically me. All right, um, this has been fun. Thanks for, for doing this. This has been you. fun. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Jay. All right. Thank well, you. Thank you, Chad. See you guys eventually to do another one of these. Hopefully, probably. Hashtag Stan Barry. Hashtag Stan Barry. Goodbye. Bye bye.